Hello everyone, and welcome to Ultimate Fanfiction, so we are back with an interesting series on what if Naruto descendant of Omnipotence God. But before we start, I just want to remind you to please subscribe to my channel and hit the like button if you enjoy my content. Let's start the story. After waiting outside in the intense sunlight for over an hour, Uzumaki Naruto had to admit that his wardrobe was less than practical. It was at times like these he would envy Shino or even the accursed Uchiha boy. Shino was always well sheltered from the sun, and Sasuke's clothing was the best of the best, it was by far superior to whatever was available for Naruto to buy. It angered the blonde, right then. Of course, the feeling never lasted. Soon, he would be distracted by something, perhaps anything, if only to free his mind of such a burden. He was quite good at that. Shutting himself out or playing dumb was a great way to get by in life. There was also the fact that he didn't hate himself as much as others did, so his mind was as comforting an escape as thinking about nothing, which he tended to do a lot. The day seemed so mundane, so routine. Sasuke sulked to his right while Sakura sulked to his left, being deprived of her chance to sit next to her favorite male on the face of the planet. The fact that today had originally been a life-changing event made no difference to Naruto. Not after he had come to the conclusion he was dreaming. The whole event had already happened. It was only a memory playing behind his closed eyes. Sweat dripped down his brow, leaving the blonde to wonder exactly how he had managed to heat his room when he was asleep. Unless he was sick, which was very possible. The more he sat in the sun, the more that seemed a plausible theory. He could do nothing about that, so he joined his teammates in sulking, thinking about nothing and allowing himself to be very miserable. A sudden plume of smoke to the face educated Naruto's adrenal system, startling him no matter how much he was expecting it. The sadistic gleam in that sleepy eye was one the Jinchuriki was all too familiar with. Hey, Kakashi Sensei. Nice to see you. Naruto greeted, wiping the sweat of his forehead with a yawn. Kakashi dismissed the respect as sarcasm, which probably wasn't going to help the young Uzumaki in the long run. Who'd upon Kakashi's arrival noticed he really wasn't feeling so great. His stomach was really hurting, as if he hadn't eaten anything, wait a minute. We've been here for hours, Sakura ranted, glaring daggers at their new instructor. This made the ninja even happier. Sasuke groaned, completely apathetic to the whole situation. A lame excuse was given. Probably the same as what had been said before, but Naruto didn't catch it. In fact his stomach hurt so badly that he didn't listen to too much of what Kakashi had said afterwards either. He pretended he did, which wasn't too horrible since he already knew the drill. Bells. Teamwork. A lot of scolding. With his stomach acting the way it was, Naruto had to admit that he is tempted to try the same stunt he pulled last time which would end with him tied to a tree stump in even more intense sun he would avoid that route if at all possible. Though the words he used in his mind to plan the event were nowhere near as eloquent. As soon as Kakashi had finished with his explanation, he stepped back, leaving his two teammates to ditch him. You really don't get the idea of hiding, now, do you? Kakashi asked casually, taking out his book. As much as those bells called to him, Naruto wasn't as stupid as he had been when he'd tried for the bells in the real world. He could also use the shade, but he still stood there, transfixed on his sensei. The fact that he already knew what made his teacher tick was more than a little humorous to Naruto. To laugh was only natural for one in his unnatural situation, it wasn't real, anyway. It was at that moment Naruto decided things were going to be different this time around, dream or not. He wouldn't just sit there and let himself be yelled at for the main flaw he was aware of having. The brain inside his body now was one that knew betrayal, loyalty, and pain. He knew that Sasuke was even more disturbed than he looked, and just how frightening a sand demon could be. He understood just how to pass the test they were currently in, and perhaps even outshine the traitorous Sasuke Teme in the process. A bitter thought came to his currently overactive consciousness. It's still just a dream. The old man is still gonna be dead when I wake up in a fever sweat, and then Sasuke Teme will still have betrayed us and left Konoha for more insane pastures. Even so, Kakashi will still respect the bastard more than he does me. That has to change. Hitaki Kakashi was dumbfounded by the behavior of this orange eyesore of a pupil. He was just given instructions that would intimidate any normal academy graduate. Yet, there he was, staring at the copy ninja with those cobalt blue eyes, mocking him, he imagined. Was the boy goading him? 
Was it a simple, narrow-minded and extremely futile part of a plan to get one of the bells tied securely to his waist? He felt himself tense up when the boy gave him an expression he had recalled being made by the Yandaimi, but could have never in a million years have expected what happened next. Sakura. Naruto called, prompting a startled sound from inside a nearby cluster of underbrush. There are only two bells, right? There are two bells and only three of us. His laughing stopped, and he put on a serious face of thought. It was an act put in place so that nothing was suspicious. No one would be more than a little surprised from learning that he is willing to give up everything for Sakura. Let's work together. All three of us, he said, smiling earnestly. The reply he got was another muffled sound from the bushes, sounding less than pleased. He pretended to get offended, causing Kakashi's features to soften just a little. Well, the visible ones, anyway. The Uzumaki boy was surprising his teacher at every turn. Sakura, I am more than willing to let you have my bell. I thought that maybe, since I've already flunked twice, I could probably breeze through the coursework like it was nothing, and I have to finish what I start. He trailed off, but was amused when even less desirable set of sounds erupted from his pink-haired comrade. It involved Sasuke, whatever she was saying, and how the two of them could do things without the dead last anyway, or something. All in all, it managed to give away her position, making her look very foolish. Kakashi sighed, putting his finger on another page of the book. They had to come at him sometime. He had honestly expected to be assaulted by then, and for the blonde village idiot to have been the one to do it. What really induced the bookmark to be put in the page was the maturity of the condemned boy's behavior. He had high expectations for Sasuke but he now realized he had completely undermined the example of demon symbiosis that was now standing right in front of him, unafraid. What are you doing, Naruto? The Jonin asked, eyeing the subject of his attentions carefully. The boy was swaying a little bit, still completely relaxed. I'm waiting, was the boy's reply. Naruto's blue eyes scanned the area, waiting for some sort of ascent or backup. He wasn't about to give away his teammates' positions that they had managed to secure once again without their assent. Several painfully stretched seconds elapsed before Kakashi sighed. They weren't coming. It was regimental responsibility, though, and he couldn't just pass Naruto for thinking like a team by himself. In fact, he should probably punish Naruto for his inability to speak in a way that made sense to his teammates or for just standing there. That wasn't very smart. That being said, the Jonin approached his target of an adolescent with one hand, preparing a kanai to attack. With one swift movement, he brought it down in a stabbing motion. Unfortunately, Naruto did not react in any way, causing Kakashi a little amount of guilt as the impact was made. He had probably just killed the troubled youth. As it could be imagined, Kakashi was pleasantly surprised when a wisp of smoke vanished where a body should have been. There was no replacement but the fact that the kid had been thinking like a shinobi with his supposed intelligence level was impressive. The elite ninja's ears strained, listening for any sounds of the other genin. There was nothing, which almost prompted a weary smile under the mask. Could it be that they were actually going to go through with it? Attacking him together? It still wouldn't work, of course. Any effort of the children would be useless. Still, it was a nice change to think of. Of course, there was still the chance that he was mistaken and that they were all going to attack on their own, and were biding time. With that on the brain, Kakashi opened his perverse book again and waited for the inevitable confrontation. Getting an Uchiha to accept you as someone of worth was hard. Thankfully, Naruto Uzumaki remembered this as he casually strolled behind the spoiled young man. Using stealth that his present self knew, but his past self hadn't, he actually managed to get behind Sasuke without being detected. It was considerably easy, too. Yo, came Naruto's voice, cracked with puberty, his reflexes prepared for the consequences. The effect was instantaneous. The would-be traitor in front of him turned around, startled, and unleashed a physical attack of desperation. Naruto ducked and grabbed his rival's ankle in a motion that flipped the young Sharingan user on his back. What the hell are you doing, loser? Sasuke sputtered, irritated and surprised. He had been expecting Kakashi. Then again. He had also expected to see Naruto get his ass handed to him. Displeased, was a minor statement as to his emotional state towards his teammate. Naruto was a stepping stone to him, this was all wrong. I am trying to cooperate with his highness, Naruto curtly replied, smiling bitterly. 
Sasuke's eyes widened in anger in the split second he could have used to react, because I have to. While the self-centered Avenger was down, the blonde ninja stepped on Sasuke's chest, perfectly aware of the kanai being tossed at him from Sakura's direction. She was aiming for her favorite spot in back of his head, so the shot was easily avoided. Let Sasuke go, you. You, that's not a toy, Sakura, he shouted, finding himself annoyed with this jog of memory as to how immature their female teammate had been. Were you really trying to kill me? That's not a very nice way to react to someone who was going to win a future for you, you know. I don't need your help, loser. Both Sasuke and Sakura interrupted simultaneously, causing the demon vessel to flinch. There was a silence as Naruto brainstormed a way to deal with this turn of events. A stroke of brilliance rewarded his efforts. Hmm, so, you think you can take down an elite on your own? Copy Ninja Kakashi? The man of a thousand jutsu? He argued, feeling his face turn red with the frustration. Hunger made him irritable, but his intellect was a lot larger than most were aware. The two he had respectfully addressed felt their jaws drop. Was their teacher really that famous? Could it be that Naruto actually read up on someone? Finding he had finally captured the rest of Squad 7's attention, the trademark smirk appeared of the face of the Yandaimi's son. For the moment, they were at his mercy. This would do. What would you suggest then, Naruto? Sakura asked, her voice shaking a little. Yes, this would do just fine. Meanwhile, the head of the team fingered his prizes restlessly. It was hard to concentrate on an erotic novel when you constantly had to fear a plan that was probably escalating in tactical brilliance. The three would-be ninja were smarter than he had assumed. At first he had waited for them to come, expecting one of the genin to foolishly challenge him like the ones that came before. Time had passed slowly, and no one came to fill his expectations. Today is just full of surprises, he mused to himself. Then, he dropped the book entirely. The forest had suddenly become eerily quiet, the birds having ceased to sing. Even the chirps of insects had become few and far between. This calm interested Kakashi, but was nothing compared to the thundering footsteps he heard moments later. Orange swarmed into his vision, clouding it with the sheer numbers of his opponent. Something inside him was disappointed when he realized that it was truly just an attack staged by only one of the hopefuls. It was even Naruto, at that. Just as he had begun to think he had misjudged the boy, he had to go and pull something like that. So it's true. You really can conjure up solid clones. Not that it matters, though, he felt himself quip. Kakashi didn't even need any real techniques to bat away the dozens of clones coming at him. They were as unrefined and careless as their original turned out to be. All the same, the Junin couldn't resist the replacement gag. A clone was soon nabbed to be used as the replacement, but never fulfilled that purpose. Fitted with an explosive tag that went off on contact, Kakashi withdrew his hand. In those few seconds, he felt a different hand clench around one of the bells and yank. The bell in question didn't get a chance to be stolen before the Junin clenched the hand and twisted it around. Nerut, he prepared to lecture, his eye lazily focusing on the miscreant that touched him. The hand belonged to Sakura Haruno stunning him significantly. The next thing he knew, a set of flying weapons flew in from his right. The replacement jutsu worked for him that time around, but Sakura was set free as a result. Sasuke almost smiled to himself at that accomplishment. Kakashi didn't reappear, and the three teammates, along with a few dozen shadow clones, searched around for him. It would not do to let the enemy get behind them. Sensei or no Sasuke's favored target of an ankle was the first to find Hitaki's location. The rest of the Uchiha soon followed as he was pulled into the ground up to his head. Earth style. Headhunter Jutsu. The gray haired man stated, appearing behind his victim. He reached for the black hair of the Uchiha boy, only for it to turn yellow. A Naruto clone, once again, a fast ball had been pulled on him. Chance. It yelled, wrenching a hand out of the soil with surprising force and grabbing something that had been next to him on the ground all along. Kakashi's visible eye widened. Another trap. He got out of the way of the new explosion just in time, but a blade was thrown in his blind spot by the real Sasuke, cutting the cords that attached the bells to his waist by a crosshair. The accuracy was amazing when the haze from the recent explosion was taken into consideration. Kakashi sensed the change in weight and reached out to catch the bells, 
but was tackled by the hyperactive blonde mastermind of the entire operation while Sasuke and Sakura took the damned things. Naruto beamed at them before being thrown off. Dread caught a hold of Naruto's heart. He was flying with his rear end completely exposed to his infamous teacher. He knew what would happen next, but screamed like a little girl anyway. A thousand years of pain found the way to his ass, followed by an intimate contact with a tree trunk. The splinters were unimaginable. Sasuke watched in morbid fascination as their sensei took two fingers to his rival's ass. Sakura honestly thought Naruto was going to die and had screamed accordingly. Kakashi chuckled after hearing the impact and got to his feet. His back was to the two. They waited for the verdict with bated breath, leaving themselves open for torture at the hands of the sadistic copy ninja. He brushed the dirt off his clothes just as the alarm bell rang for the end of the exercise. A smirk played under the Junin's mask. He stalled for a few seconds, leaving his students on pins and needles simply because he could. They had done very well, whether he had gone easy on them or not. Well, well. It looks like we have two winners. Sasuke and Sakura looked at each other and smiled. Sakura closed in for a hug, causing the youngest Uchiha to back away. Before she made contact, however, she felt a pang of hunger. One pang led to another, and she looked at Naruto's twitching form at the tree's base. There were only two bells. One separate glance told her that Sasuke was thinking the same thing. In a burst of mutual resolve, they set the bells down next to the town's mischief maker, causing him to smile widely through the scrapes. It also earned them a very disturbing grip on the shoulder from Kakashi. Disturbing in that it was accompanied by one of the most gleeful expressions they had ever seen, anyway. Correction. We have three winners who won more than a game. The first to have ever grasped this exercise, I'll add. The three of you acted as one. Three sets of eyes locked onto the teacher, waiting to burst out into individual happiness. You are all worthy to be called Jenin, you pass. Those were beautiful words to Naruto's ears no matter how many times he heard them. Though, as Sakura helped him up, he felt a bit better than he had the first time for two reasons, one being that he wasn't tied up. The other was left to speculation in his brain, as he couldn't quite place it. As Sakura let go, the Uzumaki boy realized something important. Those injuries given to him by Kakashi had actually hurt. Didn't things in dreams tend to be painless? He pondered this for a minute, but came to the conclusion that he had probably scratched himself while sleeping. That answer satisfied him for the moment but it failed to explain his literal pain in the ass. Victory was sweet for the members of Team 7. Well, more salty than sweet, but it was tasty nonetheless. It was especially sweet on the tongue of Naruto Uzumaki when washed down with Ichiraku's perfectly seasoned noodles and broth. The nectar of the gods that was ramen poured down his throat like an infusion of new life. Sasuke edgily pecked and pulled away at his food like a carrion bird content but slightly uncomfortable with the closeness of a mane of pink hair to his shoulder. She didn't have the right to touch him, he told himself, as he had many times. Who was she to think she was worth touching? He, who had witnessed so much, was entitled to his personal space. These thoughts showed on his face, but Sakura either didn't notice or ignored the nonverbal communication altogether. Sakura was grateful that they had passed the test, but she had taken very opportunity to praise her immediate crush's marksmanship over the ingenuity of the plan executed by the blonde guzzling his food like his life depended on it. Every now and then, she would casually ask something of Naruto, but found him eerily quiet. Where was the loud mouth she had become accustomed to? Certainly not across from her. Every cell in her female body screamed about the absurdity of it all. Then again, every cell also shouted that it was hungry and that dieting was a bad idea so she made a habit of not listening to them, or eating, for that matter. Naruto felt himself staring at Sasuke and Sakura, no matter how hard he tried to restrain himself. They were so young and vulnerable back then. Sasuke was still unmarked by anyone other than himself, if only it weren't just a dream. If only, he had acted so rashly back then. That wasn't to say that he never acted irrationally in the present, but he had to admit he had mellowed out to an extent. The leader of the team observed them all from a distance, not actually eating himself due to the fact he would not remove his face mask for any reason. He had explained a few things to the students, but was fairly sure that he hadn't been very well heeded. Adolescents were so easily distracted. Especially that Sakura. He'd need to work on that. Sasuke wasn't too bad. 
Kakashi hadn't expected the sought after Genin to have been too much of a nuisance anyway. No, what really kept him on his guard was the Uzumaki boy. There was something off about him. Hitaki Kakashi had been very well briefed on Naruto's situation and personality. He had no choice but to be. So how was it that an entire secret side of the boy was being exhibited during a period where he could be expected to be as immature as possible? Didn't that Aruka mention something about the kid being rash and impulsive with the Sandame concurring with that observation? He had yet to see either trait. No this kid was definitely smarter than he had let on. More mature, too. Naruto continued his meal in silence, looking at his teammates on occasion with what seemed like longing. Especially Sasuke. It wasn't that kind of longing, but it was an intense emotion raging within his student regardless. That much made sense to the Jonin. The envy probably drove him mad. To have someone that was so sought after when you were ostracized in such a way must have been terrible. Then again, Sasuke's existence wasn't exactly a happy one either. It's always greener on the other side of the hill, eh? That's not healthy. After some basic dialogue from Sasuke to Naruto, some fawning from Sakura on the point of the former, and a lot of eating on the part of the latter, the meal drew to a close. The teacher put his finger in his pockets to reach for his wallet, but was cancelled out by an intense slam from the fist of the Kyubi's boy. A few bills fell to the counter, along with a couple coins. His face was downcast and hidden. Quite a contrast to that of Kakashi's, which was wide-eyed and puzzled. If his mouth wasn't hidden, it would have been agape. I'm done, guys. There's the bill. See ya, tomorrow. He deadpanned leaving the old ramen vendor as speechless as everyone else in the closed area. The twelve-year-old's shoulders sagged with every movement. Sasuke did a double take, but thought the better of prying. Whatever the dobi was doing wasn't worth the effort. Granted, he was different somehow, but still the idiot he knew. Just because he learned a few more tricks didn't mean Naruto was even close to holding a candle to Sasuke's skills. Oh, how wrong he was. Sakura watched her orange-clad companion wander away until he vanished. For some reason, she felt she should have said something. Was he angry at them? He hadn't asked her out all day. That hurt her confidence more than she would have ever said out loud, but all the same, she needed time to figure it out. I think I'll be going home, too. I'll see you in the morning, Sasuke. She said sweetly, ignoring Kakashi altogether. He felt a bead of sweat form to the side of his head. Women. Sasuke waited until after his obsessed fan had left before breathing a sigh of relief. It was just him and the teacher. That was acceptable. Minutes passed by with the two just enjoying the calm evening. Interesting, aren't they? Kakashi asked thoughtfully, attempting to start up a conversation with a kindred spirit. Birds of a feather flocked together, didn't they? I guess. Sasuke contributed, placing his chin on his hands. He didn't even bother making eye contact and few more seconds told Kakashi that was all that was going to be said. The elite ninja sighed and stood up. He had hoped for a little more spirit. Be at the training field by eight tomorrow. He reminded his last student before vanishing entirely. Eight, meant, ten. But he didn't bother to mention such a trivial detail. Nah. They could find out for themselves. The Junin headed for his house that evening, completely unaware of the strange events that were about to unfold. Naruto walked out into the night air with more burning in his throat than he'd have liked to admit. Dreams, he now realized he hated them. Weren't they supposed to help you work through things? All his was managing to do was make the pain worse. He'd already mourned. He'd already come to grips with things. Did his mind have to torment him so? Seeing Sasuke again hadn't affected him at first, but the longer he spent next to what he was sure was a replica created by his subconscious, the deeper the wound cut. How the bastard managed to show affection from being belittled publicly was a mystery, but Naruto had missed it. Every single painful and humiliating second. Okay. Maybe almost every single painful and humiliating second. There was only so much arrogance even a saint could take. Naruto wasn't a saint, and he would be the first to admit it. Even in the short span he'd spent in his ephemeral realm, he'd wanted to kick the prissy whiner in the back several times. As for Sakura. He didn't know where to begin. A reality check would probably cash in well at her national bank. He found himself missing the self she was when he was awake. That Sakura knew herself, she wasn't a slave to what she thought she was. She was confident. This thing, 
he was contending with was only a shadow of the woman she would become. It was like missing a friend. He was thankful for Kakashi's presence in that the man never changed. He was still the same sadistic psycho bastard of a genius with a soft spot for the Uchiha. Even if Naruto buttered him up, Sasuke would probably pull their teacher in like a magnet. It was only natural that Sasuke would get attention from Kakashi, he concluded after thinking about it a little more. That didn't mean he was okay with that fact, but he was aware of the reasons it made sense. A chill hit Naruto's face, he was getting tired of dreaming now. He contemplated jumping off the fourth's nose and waking up in a fit of giggles, but decided the better of it. Maybe there really was something he needed to work through, or maybe Sasuke would blow up. The idea made him crack up even more than the suicide plan. Why wouldn't it? The black-haired miscreant had already done the same to Naruto, right? An idea hit him like Sakura would have if she had heard it. A manic smile graced his features. Well, it is my dream after all. An unsuspecting Sasuke Uchiha rolled over in his sheets. Sleep graced him, but not without causing some rather annoying habits to surface. He ground his teeth together menacingly while bunching all the covers up at his feet. And, as any other sleeper would, he involuntarily passed gas from time to time. The moonlight streamed in through his open window, accompanied by the occasional insect. The illumination landed on the Uchiha's upper face, causing his eyelids to shine in the darkness. In a moment, it was blocked by a streaked shadow, which caused no more than a slight twitch of the closed eyes. Two blue sandaled feet stealthily touched down on the ground near his head. Once again, Sasuke did not awaken. Naruto grinned. It was going quite well so far. Now, it was time for the purpose of the errand. The troublemaker pulled a permanent marker out of his sleeve and crouched down to the pale face of his rival. The canvas of Sasuke's skin was admired for a moment for being so damned perfect to write on for a nanosecond before the slightly toxic ink was pressed onto the defenseless face. Stress relief was essential for a ninja. For different individuals, there were different hobbies. To be fair, not all of them were as harmless as practical jokes. Naruto kept this in mind as he sketched on his friend's skin with surprising dexterity. After several minutes of the deed, the young shinobi inspected his work. The unibrow was a nice touch, he decided, and promptly got the hell out of the apartment before Sasuke woke up. Dream or no dream, he didn't want to be the first one the spoiled Avenger saw after discovering his new paint job. No, he hoped Kakashi would bear the brunt of it. Freaking biased teacher, Naruto slept nicely after that, he was sure he would wake up in the Konoha he was from, but that his dream had been a success. He was 104% wrong, of course, but he didn't know that. The night passed as any other, but Don would shed some new light on his situation. Coincidentally, it would also make Sasuke look like an idiot in front of several people. Sasuke woke up at around 5 in the morning every day. The first day he spent as a fully-fledged genin was no exception. Routine had him so strongly in its grasp that the groggy ninja didn't even bother looking in the mirror as he went about his business. Not that it would have made much difference anyway. Sasuke couldn't be bothered with cleaning his own mirror. The Uchiha picked out another outfit from a closet of the same garments and donned it without any more fuss than straightening it out. With that done, he brushed his hair and grabbed a quick cup of milk before heading outside to train. A courier boy that was delivering the post to him looked at him oddly the moment he left his apartment. Sasuke didn't care, though. It was nothing more than a distraction. He had to train. He did his workout routine and stretches. A combined total of about an hour and a half elapsed. It was about seven when he left his housing for the main streets. Once again, the early risers were at their own schedules. Normally he would get a couple waves and some respectful greetings, but today was different. Some of them were edgy, while others looked like they were stifling laughter. What was the big deal? Having had enough, the prodigy looked in a pond while walking through Konoha towards the training field. Upon seeing his reflection, there was a few seconds of nothing before a scream set of profanities aimed at Naruto Uzumaki. As a result, several young villagers expanded their vocabularies and ended up in various corners. Unaware of anything that was going on, Naruto slept in comfortably. A good night's sleep did a lot to put one in perspective. While everything around Naruto had been weird as of late, it was about to get prospectively weirder. Day came slowly for the unprepared mind of the young man drooling on his sheets. A beam of sunlight streamed in through his window at around 9, calling him into consciousness. 
The mattress crinkled beneath him when he slowly sat up. He pushed his feet across the covers and onto the solid ground. Ma, he drawled out, talking to himself. What a strange dream that was. The Jinchuriki pulled a cup of ramen out of his cupboard and heated the water like a ritual before sitting down in his usual position. Was it just him, or did he feel shorter than he usually was? He ate without returning to that question because the answer could have frightened him. He ate quickly, contemplating whether or not he would tell Sakura about his dream. He knew it would piss her off, but that was half the fun, wasn't it? Besides, she was mature enough now that she wasn't going to go at him with a hacksaw, right? She hadn't done that in quite some time. Instinct drove the Yandaimi's son to avoid any mirrors that morning, but he still had to get dressed. His closet would tell him what his bathroom would not. Naruto had already planned his outfit for the day. He was going to wear a black jumpsuit with one of his orange vests that he bought last week. It was going to look awesome. Lee would probably worship it. Naruto just couldn't wait. His hand reached for the drawer handle, then grasped and pulled. Unadulterated horror plastered Naruto Uzumaki's face upon seeing its contents. His breath hitched. How? That first orange jacket, he had torn it up, hadn't he? He remembered the sad day he had thrown it away. Why had it returned from beyond the clothing grave? Jackets didn't haunt, it didn't make sense. Is it possible that, he looked down at his hands, they were surprisingly smooth, weren't they calloused the last time he looked? No way. No way in hell. Unable to put it off any longer, Naruto shot into his washroom and looked at his reflection carefully. He stared back at himself, eyes wide with wonder. Was this a prank? How the hell? How? Why? The face of his reflection wasn't that of the genin he knew. No this was a child. This, is this really me? He shouted, even though he had no reply. He didn't know whether he was supposed to be overjoyed or disturbed. Had he finally cracked? This was physically impossible. There was no such thing as time travel, and his own experiences had not been a dream in any respect. Then, yesterday actually happened. Naruto felt himself foam at the mouth as he discovered that yesterday had indeed been real, and that Sasuke Uchiha really was walking around with the word, arrogance, plastered on his face with a goatee and a unibrow. The Sandame was still alive. Orochimaru was still in hiding. Was it a miracle? Was it a curse? Reasoning told him it was more than likely a sign of schizophrenia, which also seemed unlikely. Determined to prove to himself that he was correct and not just crazy, Naruto yanked his clothing on at the speed of light and trounced out his front door with one sleeve of his jacket undone. Konoha bustled around him as it always did, thinking nothing of the hyperactive boy. He was always like that. At that time, villagers would usually go out of their way to make sure Naruto Uzumaki knew that he wasn't welcome in Konoha. That day, however, no icy glare reached him. No tripping stopped him, either. He was a boy on a mission that had no letter ranking. He rushed through the crowds ere their respective market stands and towards the Hokage's mansion. If Serutobi was alive, then Naruto had to see him with his own eyes. Surely enough, the old man was outside his home speaking with some of his subordinates. Naruto's lips curved into a quivering smile from behind the gate. Tears fell from his eyes at a steady rate. The old man hadn't noticed his observer, but Naruto was happy enough just knowing he was there. Everything that had happened in his future life might as well have been a nightmare. It hadn't occurred yet, and he would be damned if he allowed it to. The day he was informed of the third's death was one of the most tragic he would ever experience. Regardless of the emotions he had shown T the time, the whole thing had left him feeling empty for so long. He couldn't handle that grief again. I'll protect you, Naruto promised in a whisper, just watching the old man speak and laugh for a few more seconds. I'll protect you even if it kills me. The Uzumaki sniffed and wiped away at his tears of joy quickly when he saw several villagers walk towards him from the corner of his eye. They all were on some sort of errand. That reminded him. Wasn't he supposed to be somewhere? What was today? There was something he was supposed to remember. It hit him like a shovel flung from a ballista. A revelation so terrible that it almost made him gag with the irony of it all. Ah, I'm going to be late. Even by Kakashi's standards. Any remaining teardrops still adorning the genin's face were air-dried during his sprint to the training field. He bowled over a couple garbage cans on the way, he was fairly certain, but some sacrifices had to be made for old time's sake. Sasuke was irate when he arrived at the training field at 8. 
His skin was red and puffy from desperately scrubbing at the marks that hadn't come off. The word, arrogance, seemed to stand out even more, if anything. Sakura had been the second to arrive, a little late because she had been doing her hair. As a woman, she had explained, she always took pride in her appearance. The explanation had continued for about one minute before Sasuke cut her off with the fact he just didn't care. Looking at him reproachfully, Sakura felt a blush come to her cheeks, she didn't know how she was supposed to go about mentioning the marker adorning her love's face. Sasuke, you're F.A., I know. That infernal Naruto. He growled, searching the horizon for the absent third member of Team 7. He was late. Was the moron afraid? Hey, served him right. The two waited together while the sun continued its ascent into the sky. After an hour and forty minutes, they were more than slightly irritated. Of course, it was right then that Naruto had to fly over the fence and into a tree directly behind Sakura. It wasn't a quiet entrance, by any means. As soon as the two punctual shinobi realized that their target of displeasure had arrived, they cracked their knuckles and stared at him like a cat would a mouse. Good, morning, the demon container choked out in between blows. Sasuke continued to beat him mercilessly for what seemed like an eternity before Kakashi showed up in his shadow. The copy ninja's visible eye twitched. The day had started out so well, too. I would stop that if I were you, he said warningly, bending down until his breath tickled the back of the Uchiha's neck. The so-called, Dobi, was forgotten and Sasuke twisted around to defend himself. Kakashi dodged easily, and then caught sight of Sasuke's face himself. The teacher cocked his head to the left, studying the markings for a short time before bursting into laughter himself. The vengeful adolescent Sasuke couldn't be any more embarrassed. Luckily for Sasuke, Relishing in the Uchiha's personal shame was the last thing on the instructor's mind. Training a girl whose mind was solely devoted to pleasing one boy, an emotional time bomb, and a hyperactive blonde was a lot harder than it sounded. The task had not sounded easy to begin with, either. As if the heavens wanted the task to be even more difficult, one was trying to kill another. Kakashi had to admit that the reason for the conflict was more than a tad bit amusing. Naruto's prank was a very direct comment on his rival's behavior. It was like a writ for individual freedom. He wanted Sasuke to know he wasn't going to take it anymore without resorting to violence. Not that it had worked, but it was a noble and or comedic idea. Could you kindly refrain from removing your teammate's internal organs with your fists, uni boy? He's going to need them later. Kakashi ordered his pupil in between intakes of breath for his next chuckling fit. Sasuke just twitched. Naruto laughed alongside his sensei from the tree to which he had retreated, he felt the killing intent flowing from Sakura, but pretended it wasn't there. He could take her in a heartbeat if she tried anything. Oi! Oh. Kakashi sensei! He interrupted at last, a promise that he'd made less than an hour ago burning in his mind. What are we going to do today? Missions? Training? Training about missions? The perverted Jonin walked past Sasuke so that he was in the center of the genin ranks and cleared his throat. Actually, I was going to have you run as many laps as possible for the next 20 minutes, he said casually, and then I was going to have us take the most humiliating D-rank on the roster. D-rank? Sakura asked, her eyes still narrowed at Naruto. Yes, D-rank missions. The lowest of the low, Kakashi replied, pulling out the book that matched Naruto's jacket. Things like weeding, gardening, hauling heavy objects. You know, minimum wage crap. It builds character. Shay, yeah, right. I'd rather be training. Sasuke complained, crossing his arms. Kakashi rounded on him in an instant. That can be arranged. You've just earned your team another ten minutes of laps. The instructor stated smugly. His word was law. Sakura looked less than amused. In fact, she looked terrified. The girl hadn't really been keeping up with her physical endurance training, obviously. From the tree branch, Naruto was smiling widely. The team had just gotten its first group sentence, and it wasn't even his fault. As if it could be better than that, Sasuke was the culprit. Any particular starting and finishing point? He heard himself ask in an earnestly cheery voice, causing his teacher to be caught off guard by Naruto's good attitude. Uh, yeah. You start at this rock and end at this rock. He replied, pointing to a boulder next to them. But before you come back you need to reach the river. Sakura looked like she was going to die. All the way to the river? From their position? That was an entire mile? 
Oh, and you can't stop for any reason, or you'll have to start over. Get it? He asked, looking from one young face to another. Sasuke leered at him. Sakura nodded mid tremble. Naruto was already running. Seeing the negative response he got from two thirds of his students, he couldn't help but inform them that was just a warm up compared to tomorrow's physical conditioning. The D ranked missions were a lot less difficult than Naruto remembered them being. Complaining had probably robbed him of a lot of time and energy he could have just used to complete the tasks. After some self observation, Naruto had discovered he had a few talents in manual labor. He could weed non stop for two hours before he needed a drink and change a feces filled diaper without complaining. He could run a message to an elderly woman in less time than it took for most to use the bathroom. For the first time in a while, Naruto felt content to be a genin. These were his fellow villagers, after all. If someone wanted to be a leader of something, they had to love it from all levels, didn't they? Still, that didn't mean he never got fed up. Sometimes the Uzumaki would get bored, or hostile towards his teammates for not leaving him alone for a second. Seriously. He didn't point out everything they did wrong. Well, not this time around, at least. Finding Tora the cat was the worst. That feline was a demon. He was sure of it. Somehow, that request came in at least three times a week. Every time, Kakashi took it without fail. Because, he had explained, it was the only mission that gave Naruto any trouble. The Janin was an equal opportunity employer. He wanted to make sure all of his students had an equal chance to be miserable. The reproach that emanated off of Sasuke after the comment was tangible. Sakura didn't really respond at all. Days rolled by, soon to be replaced by weeks. Kakashi had become ruthless with their schedules. Even Naruto was forced to get up early. Even if the Janin was always late, he still meant it when he assigned them self improvement routines to do on their own time. He knew when they didn't do it, and some teammates, Sakura, were punished severely. The truth was that Naruto really, truly, and sincerely wanted to be stronger, so it worked out perfectly for him in the end. The missions gained him a few new friends, but usually evening found the blue eyed wonder playing with Konohamaru and his posse. He found that it was fun to teach them, and that it was good practice for his patience and mental capabilities to do so. Well that, and seeing the honorable grandson create a perfect sexy transformation. Especially when they did something nice, like steal from Ebisu. Nothing valuable. Mind you. But those marshmallows were some of the most delicious the demon boy had ever tasted. Naruto still did his trivial work without complaining, but felt he should probably push the issue of more important tasks soon. In the original timeline, he remembered having thrown a tantrum around that tie that ended in them leading Tazuna and his country to freedom. The event was kind of important to Naruto. He didn't like the thought of Inari being murdered, among other things. Maybe the outcome of the whole mission could be teased into a less tragic position. The Jinchuriki spent several nights attempting to plan that out before actually deciding to go through with, Operation. Throw a tantrum. He slept well the night before, knowing that being well rested would help in the long run. Naruto Uzumaki was up bright and early the following morning, propelled by an absolute sense of excitement. However, instead of distracting him, this giddiness made him extremely productive. He ate an enormous breakfast before going through his morning exercise regimen like a madman injected with adrenaline. Not content to rest on his laurels, Sunrise saw him pacing and formulating a plan in a newly cleaned apartment. If he hadn't been so busy with looking forward to the future, he might have gloated about the fact he could, for the first time in years, eat off of the hardwood if he'd been so inclined. The morning air smelled magnificent to the fox boy's nostrils when he left his apartment at long last. It was still a tad bit chilly. But he couldn't ask for more on an early spring day. He could manage. His jacket was warm enough to compensate for his open toed shoes, and no cold breeze could affect the wide smile plastered on his face. His companions didn't react to any hurry in the Jinchuriki's stride when he met up with his team for the day, but Kakashi picked up on its manic energy. With all the maturity of adulthood, he didn't need to mention it. He knew the excitement of youth, and that it would die easily enough with the introduction of another cat hunt. To Naruto's chagrin, Sakura busied herself with a one sided conversation with Sasuke as they walked, leaving very little room for bonding before the mission. He really did miss being on the receiving end of her attention. With the advent of maturity, she made a great friend. Still, he wouldn't let her childish obsession rain on his parade too heavily. There was so much to do. 
Team 7 entered the mission assignment area casually. To Naruto's glee, he saw Uruka was near the Sandame. Since that wasn't a common occurrence, it meant his timing had been correct. The operation could commence as planned. Sarutobi finished speaking to a group of attendants, his office as bustling as any other village elder on a weekday, and then addressed the group before him. His voice carried the usual amount of gravitas. For today, there are several missions available for Team 7. At the top of the list is babysitting the three year old granddaughter of. No, Naruto interrupted, prompting incredulous expressions from everyone in the room. Uruka looked as irate as he had the first time his immature pupil had mouthed off as such. His eyes were wild and worried. Odd that Naruto hadn't noticed it before, but maturity brought with it social insight the young lacked. Of course, Uruka didn't want him doing anything even remotely dangerous. Naruto, what the hell do you mean? No, you three are Jen and the lowliest of the low. He furrowed his eyebrows. You're supposed to start with these little errands. They build character, discipline. No, Naruto said again, working very hard to keep his face straight. It felt strange to play the spoiled brat consciously, but also incredibly satisfying. His opposition lingered in the air awkwardly. None of his teammates had attempted to dissuade him yet. Maybe they approved of his outburst? He doubted that anyone in his group felt fulfilled by the grunt work to which they'd been assigned. Kakashi, the person who would be the most likely to raise an objection, seemed more than willing to allow the misbehavior to continue. In fact, he appeared slightly amused. Sarutobi gave a knowing smirk. He had been expecting something like this for some time now. Naruto had been quiet lately. Too quiet for a child of his rambunctious age. It was good to see him acting normal again. Know what, Naruto? The old man asked genially, studying the bright eyed preteen with patience. No more of these kiddie missions, Naruto stated loudly, putting his hands on his hips. Sakura sputtered a quiet plea for him to shut up, but that didn't stop his rant from continuing. I hardly see how moving trash from one place to another hones our abilities as ninja. I mean, I understand how you sort out all those requests you get every day according to letters and difficulty and stuff, but could we forget that part? We've done our time. Again, no one interrupted or silenced outside of Sakura's predictable interjection. It seemed everyone was listening to him attentively for a change. Naruto knew the attention was scrutinizing, and that the fate of the Land of Waves depended on how he phrased his question. No pressure, right? His fingers fidgeted before he finally set up his portion of the argument. He decided to go with his original strategy. It was time to act like the insecure boy he was supposed to be. He puffed up his body language, he had to really sell his self-doubt and desperation here, and it was far less than he had suffered from before. The body he inherited was weak, but he knew how to project confidence. What he had to do now was overdo it. I. I want to prove I'm not a kid anymore. I can handle more than this. Come on, give me a real mission. He begged, making sure to exaggerate his body language in true Uzumaki form. The following glare Naruto got from Uruka was both short and quickly rerouted to his teacher. Kakashi felt a sinking feeling in his stomach. Naruto had no doubt his teacher would be hearing about this later. The blanching the Hitaki was busy demonstrated indicated it would not be a pleasant experience. Despite the tense atmosphere, a short but hearty laugh flew through the room. The Hokage puffed on his pipe happily. He could work with this. So, the brat wants to test his mettle? Fine. I've got just the thing. Kakashi's eye widened considerably and Naruto couldn't help but think that Sasuke looked like he was going to give birth from his gullet. Really? The copy ninja deadpanned, disbelief obvious in his tone. Yes, Sarutobi replied, pulling a scroll out of one of his many massive, leaning piles of parchment. A C rank, in fact, he hummed and parsed through the text, you will be escorting someone. Who? Sakura asked immediately, her eyes on the door. You'll see, the old man said calmly motioning to a shinobi near the arch send him in he instructed naruto was not disappointed in the least when he saw an elderly builder enter the room in a slightly drunken stupor well aside from with the smell wafting off the old man he really really tried not to wrinkle his nose in disgust until he remembered that he was supposed to be acting like a stupid adolescent kakashi nonchalantly scratched the back of his head sakura and sasuke just stared all in all Impressions were made pretty quickly. Wah? A bunch of snot nosed kids? The client asked, 
dripping with slurred outrage. The Hokage didn't react one way or another, but the builder continued. I bet they couldn't even protect a rock, he accused, only taking enough time to point an especially wrinkled finger at Naruto. Especially that short one with the idiotic look on his face. Naruto's eyes narrowed. The last time Tazuna had used that line, he had taken the bait and looked like exactly like he was described as a result. He could just ignore it, but damn it if he didn't take acting juveniles seriously. Sorry, he said, but I always look like this when I'm being yelled at by a smelly old hobo. Naruto, the sandame chided softly. Someone else choked on their own spit. While Naruto didn't care to imagine what Aruka was thinking, as he was emanating some sort of dark aura in response to Naruto's insolence, Sasuke snorted. Uzumaki got the distinct impression that his old comrade was enjoying himself. Tazuna shut up as a result of Naruto's rebuttal, allowing Kakashi to use the opening in the conversation for introductions. They were kept brief, but the mission was the same as he had remembered. Tazuna redoubled his commitment to being a total ass. Thinking back, Naruto thought it strange that he didn't notice any red flags in the old builder's mannerisms, but he guessed it was only natural. He had been too busy reacting to the man's insults. Between Tazuna and Sasuke, I wonder if I'll have any self esteem left. The blonde thought wryly, suddenly having second thoughts for the sake of his own sanity. Less than an hour would find the five outside of Konoha's gates. Though things had been going swimmingly thus far, Naruto couldn't help but feel uneasy about the confrontations ahead. He hadn't been in this new body for very long, and without all of Jiraiya and Kakashi's conditioning, he didn't really feel up to combat. He tried to calm himself down as he began to think about the things that could go wrong. It wasn't like him to worry so constantly, but it wasn't like him to travel back in time after. Wait. What exactly had he been doing before he ended up in this prepubescent body, anyway? Absorbed in troubling thoughts as he was, the fair weather and pleasant breeze did nothing to soothe his skittish nerves. Try as he might, he couldn't refrain from scanning the path ahead for a telltale sign of an attack. To mask his irritation, he started a wordless competition with Sasuke. Whenever the Uchiha would step ahead of him, Naruto started walking faster. They accelerated in such small increments that it took minutes before either were jogging. By that time, the dreaded puddle had already appeared on the dirt path before them. Naruto's neck hair stood on edge the moment his blue eyes spotted it. Despite weeks of careful planning, he couldn't be entirely calm. Even the knowledge that Kakashi was aware of that he didn't diminish the anticipation. He was playing a game of deadly hide and seek, where the anticipation got to you more than actually being found. Naruto forced himself to walk past the tiny pool of illusionary water and was pleasantly surprised that nothing lashed out at him outright. Only to hear Sakura's scream soon after. He swirled around out of instinct. He was just in time to watch the mist Chunin's chains wrap around what he knew was a clone of their sensei. He had to hand it to the Junin, he made his death seem highly convincing. The display was nauseating. Another scream from Sakura yanked his senses into even higher gear. This one was prompted by a situation that alarmed the blonde beyond belief. It was unplanned. He had failed to take Sakura's current weaknesses into mind when he had formulated the plan and internally kicked himself. The enemies were supposed to attack him, so why were they targeting Sakura? He saw the claw head for her. He could tell she was making a dash to evade, but it wouldn't be fast enough. He began to focus chakra. Surely he could augment his speed. No, it wouldn't be enough in this inferior body. The attack would hit her head on, and then be followed by a relentless string of potentially fatal finishers. He had only fractions of a second before his future best friend would be slaughtered. He heard Sasuke barking orders to Tazuna, but the voice was coming from too far away. As for Kakashi, that enigmatic man could be anywhere. There was no time. No time. Before he realized he had moved, Naruto felt himself pushing Sakura out of harm's way. The poisoned claw sunk deeply into his back in her stead, rending fabric and flesh. It was a mind-numbing agony punctuated by the snapping of bone. He couldn't contain the screams, despite his best efforts. He was moving, but not of his own volition. He'd been snagged like a fish on a line, and the enemy ninja would be fools not to take advantage of it. Even if the attack was psychological. Gods, it hurt to be dragged. He vaguely heard his teammates shout his name desperately through the fog that was rapidly replacing his faculties. Before any new wounds could be inflicted on him, he felt the claw ripped away by a familiar pair of gloved hands. 
His eyes worked very hard to focus on his savior. Kakashi Sensei. To say that the Kakashi swimming in his vision was livid would be an understatement. Naruto rarely ever saw the man this angry, even in that future that slipped further and further away from his grasp. The man's forehead protector had been ripped away leaving both eyes fully open and menacing. Naruto knew that the Sharingan was likely rotating, and the enemy ninja knew to react with fear at the senior ninja's presence. Naruto could feel his rage, his body was unbelievably tense while ripping his student out of the enemy assassin's clutches. As soon as Naruto's failing body was removed from the claw, Kakashi turned the weapon back on its masters, but the damage that followed wasn't enough. The Uzumaki Saiyan could smell the burst of ozone that signaled the use of the Chidori. And of course, there was Sakura. She hadn't stopped making noise since the whole thing began. Tears were already gathering in the corners of her eyes. Naruto. She had shrieked, reaching out for his hands before they were cruelly dragged away by the weapon's hold. Only once her instructor had intervened could she frantically gather him up in her arms. It was odd that her voice hadn't been alone. Naruto could have sworn. Was Sasuke calling out, too? The bridge builder had petrified by the entire display. The kid he had insulted had sacrificed himself, he was just a child. During the heartless slaughter of the two enemy shinobi, Tazuna could swear that some of Kakashi's rage was directed at him. The killing intent washed over him in waves. Against a vengeful Kakashi Hitaki, the demon brothers didn't stand a chance. The Chidori rammed through them before they even had time to retract their weapon entirely. The attack drilled through the two without giving them a chance of survival. Their last moments were filled with blue light, and the sight of Kakashi's tears. Naruto hadn't seen anything his instructor had done, but he could feel the intense emotion that followed like a stifling envelope. Well, it was either that or the blood in his lungs. It was a little stupid, though, after everything Naruto Uzumaki had accomplished, after the heights of strength he'd previously reached, after all of his now forgotten victories, here he was, dying ignobly like a dog. Sakura's hands brushed over his face in comforting motions. It felt nice, but it didn't change the primary problem that Naruto was fading away. No amount of the Kyubi's chakra could reverse the poison by that time, he knew. If it could have, it would have already done so. Either that, or. Warm drops of salty water fell on his skin. Was this really it? He was going to die on his first C rank mission? Tazuna would be sent back without an escort for sure, and Inari, he couldn't allow it, he wouldn't allow it, still, he felt death's approach. It was getting cold, and Sakura held him even more tightly, she was calling his name. The sounds grew quieter and quieter, then, there was nothing but darkness. Whispers flew in Naruto's ears when he felt himself become aware once more. The sensation of falling enveloped him. He opened his eyes to a darkness deeper than he had ever imagined dotted with unpredictable flashes of colored light. His spirit was overwhelmed, but fought itself desperately. The temperature fluctuated constantly while he tried to move, only to realize that there was nothing to move in. He was flying through a substance with thinner than air with the fluency of water. Sounds traveled through it, caressing his ears. The whispers flew with music, something so beautiful that he couldn't move. It frightened him. Fear rendered him helpless and he felt he might die again in the incomprehensible abyss. Try as he would, he could make no sound himself. For a moment, he thought he saw a face, but it vanished as quickly as it appeared. He felt a set of hands gently grasp him in the darkness. He was still falling, he knew, but he was no longer afraid. The arms held him with such intense love that he was enveloped in it. His fear dissipated, and he listened. Naruto, my son. Naruto felt the words from the entity cradling him and so wished to see her. Tears stung his face. Mama! He choked out, aware of the ethereal sound his own voice arms were now accompanied by the feeling of lips to his forehead. He was crying freely now. His arms returned her embrace. No sooner had he done so, the darkness fell away to reveal a great caged door. Naruto struggled to keep hold of his invisible mother but found she evaporated in his grasp long before he hit the ground of his mind's chamber with a thud, he called for her, but she couldn't return. Two blindingly red eyes bore into his naked form from behind bars. He heard Pa's pace behind the sealed doorway, and saw the occasional flash of teeth. The fear that his mother had relieved him of returned in full force, but he stood firm. No words were exchanged, 
but Naruto was compelled to step forward until he was directly in front of one of the bars. Low growls emitted from the entity inside, and soon the red eyes locked onto his completely. A burst of hot breath blew the boy's hair backwards like a gust, and the next thing he knew, the reality he had just obtained flew away like pieces of broken glass. Naruto Uzumaki's head flew up with a scream. His nightcap flew to the far reaches of the room when the disturbed youth threw himself onto the ground of his apartment. A brief inspection proved that he was still alive. There were no wounds, no proof of anything. A dream? No, it couldn't have been. Short spurts of past events played in his head. He had felt the claw, he had heard everything leave him behind. He remembered the darkness, and someone reaching out to him he remembered the sensation of the fox's gaze, and the ephemeral world shattering around him. Naruto. He ordered himself aloud. Pull yourself together, nothing you can do about it now, anyway. The face in the mirror looked haunted, tired, and as young as it had earlier. No part of this was a dream. It had happened for real. Naruto Uzumaki had died. So how was he sitting in front of his mirror in the middle of the night before his fatal choice? Thinking about it made his head spin. He wished he remembered everything that had just occurred, but the memory of his descent was fading, taking his mother with it. The knowledge remained, however. Naruto had died and returned to the night before, unscathed. Bittersweet emotion racked him for a few more seconds before leaving him numb and exhausted. His body demanded sleep, and it would be damned if it didn't get it soon. Meaning, of course, that it would collapse no matter how much the brain was in use. As of right then, that was quite a bit. It slowed considerably, though. Think about it in the morning, he muttered to himself before wandering back to his still warm bedding and dropping there, almost as dead as he had felt an hour prior. Slumber took with it his cares, his worries, and any remaining memory of his post-death experience. No mortal was to remember such a thing. It would drive them to madness. The Uzumaki boy would awake the next day with recollections of nothing but his death. He would wake as if he had a nightmare and retry the day armed with new knowledge. The mortal coil could not hold him, and time lost her sway where the young man tread. He could choose what controlled him, be it morals or madness. Time in the confusion would test the strength of his heart, but it had yet to weaken. The Kayubi had the powers of a god, but that was nothing compared to the hands that wielded them. If the child was to be bound to such an entity, was it so mad to think he would no longer be a prisoner to the laws of order? In a world held together by so many factors, was it so strange to think of the dire consequences of cutting but a few? The answer was not in the hands of mortals. No matter the problem, the solution was always simpler than it seemed. Phenomenon would go unexplained, and the orphan Jinchurki would probably never understand the reasons for his chronological exemption. Heaven hadn't chosen him for his wisdom, but for his soul. The spirit unbroken was more powerful than the gods themselves. Ultimately, the ideals spoke of in his dreams would all amount to one thing. Respawn, bitches. Sakura Haruno felt very strange about the looks she was getting from Naruto. They had only just left the village. Did he think the same rules of etiquette did not apply once the walls were no longer around them? If he did, he had another thing or two coming. She looked in his eyes, expecting to find lust or adoration. She was a little frightened when neither were present. Naruto, who never worried, was afraid of something. That much she learned before he looked away, ashamed of himself. Naruto? She asked immediately thereafter, hoping for some sort of explanation for his behavior. Yeah, Sakura-chan? He asked, his voice tired. The sun bounced off his tousled hair that looked ragged with tossing and turning. It almost reminded her of a dead bush in contrast to the vibrant countryside. Why the hell did he ask for a more difficult mission in his state? He looks like he didn't sleep at all. The inner Sakura ranted, but the outer mask smiled sweetly. Are you feeling okay? The addressed ninja blinked wearily, then nodded slowly. Sasuke made a sound of disbelief from the other side of him, but the orange clad Uzumaki promptly ignored it. Then don't stare, Sakura scolded, landing a blow on the sensitive spot of her teammate's head. Naruto's eyes briefly flashed with resentment but he refrained from looking at her for the next eight miles or so. In fact, he seemed absorbed with the dirt ahead of him. On a day as nice as the one that graced them, the girl couldn't help but feel that was a waste. Naruto, meanwhile, was very busy thinking of a way not to die in the next the next ten minutes. Somehow, he had to find a way to prepare himself for any variation of attack that could possibly happen. 
The Chunin were very likely to target Sakura again, but some evil part of the blonde boy's brain hoped they'd choose Sasuke this time around. Guilt followed that wish, though, so Naruto made short work of it. The infamous puddle showed up far too soon for the Uzumaki's liking. Truth be told, it marred an otherwise perfect landscape, and could be resented for that alone. At that exact moment, an idea struck the boy like a ton of bricks. I need a walking stick, Naruto announced, gesturing wildly at the forest. Kakashi did a double take at the sudden outburst while Sakura flinched. Excuse me? He asked, eyebrows furrowed. The hell, Dobi? Sasuke wanted to know what exactly had just happened in his rival's head. His shout was too random to even be typical of Naruto's personality. Naruto didn't reply. He just dashed off the path and grabbed a long stick. He returned instantaneously and waved it in front of Sasuke like a dog treat. The Uchiha then whipped a hand out in an attempt to break it and missed, which caused Naruto to goad him even more. After about three tries, Sasuke gave up and pretended he didn't care. The teacher groaned at this typical and troublesome behavior, it wasn't worth the energy those two wasted. The quintet walked past the seemingly innocent puddle of death yet again, and once more Sakura screamed while the Jonin faked his death in a convincing and gory fashion. Even Naruto found it disturbing as to how well Kakashi executed the illusion. From the blood, guts, and all the way to the internal organs, everything was very impressive. Naruto never wanted to see it again, let alone learn how to pull it off. The chained claw chose Sakura as its victim yet again. Naruto grimaced and hoped he'd get the timing right when he thrust the stick through a chain link and pulled the weapon backward. Unfortunately for him, the stick wasn't heavy enough to reel the heavy claw back entirely. The piece of timber snapped before he could gain complete control of the weapon, leaving him vulnerable to other attacks from the enemy. Having a toxin-coated kanai thrust into the side of your neck was not one of the most pleasant experiences on earth, Naruto quickly learned. Especially, he amended, when it was followed by another. The fact that he had saved Sakura's life was the about the only thing that kept him from weeping bitterly inside at his new defeat. That, and he learned an important lesson about gravity and momentum. They caused things to break when one object was heavier than the other, next time, he would get a metal staff before leaving Konoha. If there is a next time, he corrected himself bitterly from his new cradled position in Sakura's arms. More than a little guilt consumed him when he felt her sobs. He knew from the sounds around her that the Chunins were once again getting their hearts ripped out by an enraged Kakashi, and that Sasuke might have been helping, but all the same. Naruto, I can't, sob don't go, I'm so sorry, why you still have to be Hokage, remember, she struggled to speak through her tears. She was once again rubbing her hands in soothing circles on his skin, but he could feel her fingers were slick with his own red blood. It sucked that she wouldn't remember what he did for her if his hunch was correct, he was probably going to wake up in his own bed again. Sa, Ku, Ra, D, he began to say, his intent being to say, don't worry, it'll be okay, but found his heart stopped inconveniently at that exact moment. It would figure that being stabbed twice in the jugular artery killed a 12-year-old body faster than a claw wound to the back, then. Again, it would also figure that once you were killed you would stay dead. Logic was such a fickle mistress as of late. For what now seemed the umpteenth time, Naruto's world of perception went black, and was soon replaced by the sensation of falling. Naruto woke up screaming in his bed, but didn't panic like he had in the past. The sensation of dying was unpleasant, to be sure, but it always ended quickly thus far. He had again ended up in his room, tired and disoriented. Everything was as he remembered it to be. Even the magazines he had been looking at several days ago were open to the page he had been skimming. Reassured by familiarity, the shinobi's bare feet touched down on the wooden floorboards. After getting dressed, Naruto's brain immediately went to work on the plan for the day. I need a metal pole of some sort, where can I get that? His brain went as far as asking Uruka for one and stopped. Why would Uruka have a pole? Granted, he had a lot of other useful items, but a freaking metal beam? He thought again while brushing his teeth. Maybe he could break a table for a leg of some sort? But that wouldn't be strong enough, idiot. These are heavy chains we're dealing with. Maybe you should just try a different plan altogether, his face scrunched up with displeasure at his own logic. Bah? Who am I kidding? I want to use a polearm. After some deliberation, 
the Uzumaki youth decided to use what remained of his monthly stipend to buy an actual bow staff at the weapon shop. The owner was a little reluctant to let the hyperactive blonde have it, for obvious reasons, most involving the boy's own safety, but gave in after about 10 minutes of begging. Grinning victoriously after walking off with his prize, Naruto studied the weapon he'd obtained. It had been a cheaper model, but it seemed sturdy enough. It was made of some sort of iron encased over the wood of a spindle tree. There were several simple designs carved in the bronze-toned metal, but nothing especially eye-catching. He tried whacking it against a boulder with all his might, but it didn't so much as scratch. It took some amount of self-restraint not to kiss his new staff for being so incredibly useful. When he met up with his team, none of them seemed too entirely surprised to see him playing with a gilded stick. It did cross their minds to wonder where and when he got it, though. Sakura had actually thought to ask, and was mildly amused by Naruto's simplistic reply. Oh, yeah, I bought it this morning at the weapon shop because it sounded like fun, databio. Pleading for the C-ranked mission didn't take as much time as it had on the last few occasions, and the next thing Naruto knew, he was on the hazardous path again. To amuse himself, he had taken to throwing his staff and catching it, despite Kakashi's subtle warnings that he would miss sooner or later. To be honest, he ended up, missing, several times just so it would prompt Sasuke to be bumped with the airborne object. The third time he tossed the stick and let it fly, the sensei caught it and bashed him on the head. Cut it out. Kakashi ordered, unshaken but still unmistakably annoyed. Naruto hung his head submissively and grabbed his toy yet again. This time he kept it to himself, mostly. When the accursed puddle made its debut, Naruto was feeling pretty high on himself. The new staff was reassuring in his hands while the group walked past the unexplained spot of water. The next 30 seconds went by as planned. Kakashi faked his death in order to shake off the enemy. Sasuke ran to defend the builder, and Sakura screamed a lot. When the claw went for the pink-haired girl yet again, Naruto was ready. With a burst of speed, he thrust his staff against the extending chain, pushing it off course. While that was happening, he made sure to move his neck out of the path of two deadly knives. They landed in a tree's trunk with a thunk. The smaller demon brother charged the twelve-year-old boy, the chain that connected the two straining. The enemy was quick, but somehow Sakura found the time to scream before Naruto jumped over his attacker. In a quick and calculated movement, the blonde threw himself onto the chain between the two chunin. While he was still a child, the velocity of his movement added to his impacting weight. With the chain jerked downwards, the two missed shinobi were in trouble. Their mobility was halted, and the shorter of the two missed ninja felt an impact on the back of his skull that forced him to black out. Naruto knew he had left his back vulnerable. In fact, he had done it on purpose when he struck the short assailant in the back of his noggin with his new toy. Why? Well, he had a perfectly capable team, didn't he? Surely enough, Kakashi's hand closed around the taller demon brother before he could fling any sort of attack at the Jonin student. With a loud snap, the gray-haired man broke his enemy's wrist and pinned him against a tree. Any particular reason you thought the disguise of a puddle in a dry month was a good idea? He asked with a hint of amusement. That was stupid of me, I'll admit. The older demon brother spat a venomous glare betraying his mental instability to the world. With that, he bid down on his lips under the scrutinizing gaze belonging to one of Konoha's finest. So, care to tell us what you're after, demon brothers? Kakashi asked absently, proving that he knew his adversary well. You're Hitaki Kakashi, aren't you? The man of a thousand jutsu? The self-proclaimed demon shrieked at him. How are we supposed to know that the old man would have you protecting him? The conversation, interrogation continued, but Naruto found himself staring at his unconscious victim instead of listening. At one point, he had started to stir, and Naruto was forced to hit him again. Stay down, you puddle bastard. He growled, then looked up to see Kakashi reprimanding Tazuna for lying. Had we known we were going to be attacked by enemy ninja, we would have staffed differently. As of now, we are beyond the scope of this mission. We are no longer bound by contact or honor. He informed Tazuna calmly with Sakura nodding next to him. We could have gotten killed back there. We should go back to the village. Sakura reasoned, wringing her hands together nervously. Sasuke looked like he had half a mind to agree with her, too. Hum, going back to the village sounds like a good idea. You genin aren't ready for this, obviously. 
The Jonan agreed, stroking his chin. Tazuna looked at the ground, unable to argue and ashamed. Naruto Uzumaki gawked. He didn't know quite what he should say. He couldn't make the vow he made last time, that was for sure, so, what could he do? Naruto? Kakashi asked, impartially waiting for the final team member's reply. No way. The dead last shouted, deciding to act on impulse. A real ninja would never go back on a promise, and we promised to deliver this builder to his country unharmed. Sakura scowled at this. What are you saying, you idiot? You almost got killed back there. For no apparent reason, the Uzumaki child burst into laughter at this. She has a point, Dobi. Sasuke commented, eyeing the two with disinterest. Oh, trust me. I know came the blonde's breathless, and somewhat mirthful, reply, leaving the Uchiha speechless. Well, that settles it, Kakashi announced, putting a finger to his head. We aren't turning back yet, but if things get too tough, we're leaving. Good enough for me. Naruto smirked, watching Tazuna's eyebrows furrow. The old man didn't know whether to be grateful or worried. Naruto's feet felt numb and sticky. They'd been traveling for what now seemed like an eternity. The sun had gone from directly overhead to behind the hills in the west. The last streaks of daylight colored the horizon like spilled paints from a child's art project. How much further? Naruto asked his sensei delicately, trying his utmost best not to nag or push the subject. The question had already come out of him three times that evening. If he didn't ask, no one would. We'll get there when we get there. Kakashi sighed irritably, rubbing his right temple. The Jonin had constantly been on his guard after the morning's assault, and it was beginning to tax him physically. Not having even probably assisted his fatigue to where it was right then, too. And when we get there, I'm going to tell you. Naruto. Stop asking that, it's so annoying. Sakura ordered breathlessly from the rear. Ironically, for all of her attitude, she was still dragging almost as much as their client. Naruto almost felt sorry for her. E.H. Sakura-chan. I can carry you on my back if you'd like, he offered, stopping for a little while to let his teammate catch up. That's just weird, you know, Sasuke Uchiha commented while passing the blonde boy. I wasn't talking to you, I was talking to Sakura-chan, Naruto scowled indignantly, shaking his fist at the blue-clad back ahead of him while waiting for the pink-haired Kunoichi's reply. Um, no, thanks, Sakura awkwardly communicated from behind a forced smile. Naruto was slightly relieved at the response. As kind as his offer had been, he was probably too tired to keep it up for long. To prove he understood, he gave a quick nod and started walking again. The trek lasted well into the night. The group slept under the stars, taking watch in turns, and pressed on again at dawn's first light. The genin's bodies weren't used to the strenuous traveling, so Kakashi pulled off a rare act of mercy and allowed them a few breaks early on. As the second day moved on, however, he began to push them to move even faster. Naruto noted that the environment was changing by that afternoon. It seemed colder, for one thing. For another, the plants took on a deeper hue of green. Fog settled in, making everything look strangely bewitched. We must be getting close. Still, I'd better ask for good measure. Sensei, how f? Naruto. Don't you dare. Sakura interjected, her voice menacing. After a quick glance, the Uzumaki found that her body language matched. His legs subconsciously sped up to avoid the female's wrath, and consequently found themselves underwater with the rest of his body. Kakashi put his palm to his face and waited for his student to surface. A shinobi watches where he's going, Naruto. Come to think of it, nearly every rational human being does. Naruto emerged from the waters, humiliated. Yeah, yeah, he mumbled taking off his jacket and shaking it off as close to Sasuke as possible. The Uchiha had anticipated this and moved out of the way of the flying droplets. Tazuna, who had been staring into the distance at that point, shouted something into the fog. To the surprise of everyone but Naruto and the old man himself, there was actually a yell in return. Soon, a silhouette appeared through the mist. Pre-arranged transport? Kakashi asked casually. Yes. A friend of mine who goes by Nibiru. He's gonna take us to the mainland. The builder replied, taking a swig from his seemingly bottomless flask of booze. Naruto squinted to see the approaching boat. It was just as he had remembered it, shabby and without the motor running, fun. 
The next thing the boy knew, he was in the vessel with his team, staring into the dreary nothingness for over an hour. During that time, Kakashi had pried into the builder's situation and revealed the truth about Gato, and so forth. The conversation really didn't interest Naruto the second time around, but he had acted like he was listening. Nibiru dropped them off eventually, saying that it was too dangerous for him to go farther. Tazuna thanked his friend and led the Konoha ninjas to shore. It was at that point that Naruto began to get afraid. While it had taken him three times to stand up to the Demon Brothers, Zubaza was in a league of his own. Even Kakashi had struggled with the former Anbu elite. And, if memory served, Naruto had played a key part in getting them all out alive. With things the way they were, there was no way that the encounter would go the same way as it had last time. It had been sheer dumb luck that had allowed his team to spot the eyebrow less sociopath before, his dumb luck. In fact, there was no telling whether or not such a chance would present itself again. The boy looked at his bow staff flatly. As amazing as it had been thus far, it wouldn't be able to make even a slight difference against Zubaza's giant blade. How the man held the sword escaped the young ninja's comprehension. Regardless of the reason, Naruto was still pretty sure the older man was compensating for something. Why carry a sword that big, anyway? Sheesh, Kakashi had begun the walk just as wary as Naruto, but for other reasons. He didn't know what to expect, to be sure. All he knew was that it was going to be more of a challenge than two chunin. He had some peace of mind with knowing that his students could defend themselves for the most part. Naruto's display the day before had been, well, impressive. Whatever happened, he could be pretty confident that Tazuna would be in good hands. On a lighter note, the made a mental note to get his blonde pupil scheduled for staff lessons when they returned to Konoha. The sloppy form the boy was using would eventually be problematic if left uncorrected. On top of that, Naruto wasted too much chakra, something had to be done about that. As for Sakura, he would have to break her like a horse. That girl needed to shape up, and fast. She couldn't just expect to get by on brains alone. The ninja world wasn't like that. Intelligence was important, to be sure but it had to be accompanied by some sort of specialty. She had to be able to defend herself. If Naruto hadn't been there for her in the last enemy encounter, she probably would have been killed. Sasuke needed two things. A spanking and chakra control. It wasn't the boy's weakness, but it still wasn't his strong point. Maybe he could find some sort of training exercise that would benefit all three of his genin. With that on his mind, he became a little lax on his guard. Too bad because Zabuza was lying in wait less than a mile ahead. A well-sculpted man crouched behind a tree, listening and waiting. His muscular form sat atop a sword that defied convenience in size. The man breathed slowly, so still that even the local wildlife began to act as if he had been nothing more than an extension of the tree itself. A bird perched on his kneecap, nestling against the fabric while it groomed itself. Zabuza could have killed it with just a slight movement if he had wanted but the creature remained unharmed. In fact, the assassin found himself temporarily enamored with it, if only to pass the time. Patience came naturally to the criminal, it was essential for missions such as the one he was currently employed with. Sooner or later, his target would come down that path. As the situation usually favored the latter, the elite outlaw would find very odd ways to occupy himself. He counted the seconds in his head, 235. The wren stayed on his leg for over three minutes, completely unafraid of the owner of its perch. The blind faith reminded him of someone, but he didn't actually name the bridge right away. What is that Haku doing? Didn't I tell him to stay close? He wondered, fairly certain it wouldn't matter, but curious nonetheless. For all he knew, his young ward could be anywhere. It crossed Zabaza's mind to be a little concerned, but he instantly dismissed it. There probably wasn't anything to worry about. The demon of the mist let out a sound of irritation, scaring the bird that had taken a liking to his knee. Without so much as a peep, it took off into the forest beyond. Almost immediately, Zubaza Momochi missed the warmth it had left on his skin. With the heat gone, the humid cold of evening was free to seep in more than it had before. Time passed slowly, leaving the former commander time to eat a quick meal. The stale hunk of rice didn't last very long, but it left him feeling more efficient. He needed all the strength he could gather, just in case things got tough. He really needed the money. A tuft of gray hair got stuck in a low lying twig. The owner of the tuft in question stifled a sound of disdain and pulled away from the snag. Despite his constant vigilance, 
The occasional branch from the marsh trees smacked or ensnared Kakashi Hitaki. Between his lack of depth perception and tall hairstyle, that had happened a lot in the last few days. The scalp irritation aside, Kakashi had developed a headache anyway. Two of them, in fact. Naruto had, for whatever reason, decided he needed to mimic Sasuke's every movement, causing the Uchiha more than a little bit of annoyance. Since Sasuke didn't do very much other than walk with poor posture and brood, it was a fairly easy task to copy his actions. At first, it had been entertaining for the three not involved. After about two minutes, however, it got old. Quit it, Naruto. Sasuke demanded abruptly, having had enough. Make me, the addressed spat, his eyes filled with glee. Shut up, Naruto. Sakura growled from the left of Tazuna. Her green eyes were sharp with irritation. Tazuna was tuning them out, at least. Naruto snorted and made to begin again before stopping suddenly, forcing Kakashi to bump into him. His blue eyes began searching the area frantically. Did you guys hear that? He asked dramatically, his eyes wide with fear. Sakura and Sasuke looked at their teammates skeptically. Tazuna was split between being worried and being furious. Even Kakashi looked ready to groan at what he thought was a joke on Naruto's part before he heard it, too. Canvas brushing against bark. The sound in itself was so minute that not even an elite could be blamed for not pinpointing it. For Naruto to have noticed such a small detail was impressive. You three! He shouted to his students, his visible eye calculating, defense formation around the builder. Naruto Uzumaki did not know what else to do, so he immediately obeyed. He stood to Tazuna's left while Sasuke stood to the right. Sakura protected the rear so that together the trio formed a triangular defense around the elderly man. With that, they waited for their hidden opponent to reveal himself and make a move. Zabuza was frustrated when he was discovered. It had been an obnoxious child who had heard him, no less. He began to wonder if he was losing his touch when he recognized the leader of the ragtag team. The assassin's breath hitched with anticipation. He had to plan quickly if his speculation was correct. So, no wonder the demon brothers failed to take the old man down, Zabaza's voice spoke in a low rumble. Kakashi's head whipped around to locate the source. Copy Ninja Kakashi. Surely enough, the man standing on the branch with a broadsword haphazardly balanced on his shoulder was no small threat. The Konohajanan immediately exposed his Sharingan to the shirtless predator, causing Sasuke to flinch and shiver. Everyone, be careful. This man is way out of your league, the instructor warned, never taking his eyes off Zubaza, who was now executing a jutsu. The Sharingan watched every movement carefully, but was effectively rendered useless soon enough. A mist thicker than any they had experienced on their journey quickly surrounded them. Naruto instinctively stepped closer to the builder and accidentally bumped into Sasuke, who was still trembling with mortal terror. Under any normal circumstance, the blue-eyed troublemaker would have mocked his rival's weakness. Right then, however, he understood the importance of having Sasuke as a fully functional warrior. With that in mind, the Uzumaki's elbow gently nudged the petrified Uchiha's ribs. Two terrified dark eyes bored into Naruto's blue ones. Swallowing his own fear, Naruto forced a reassuring smirk. The nonverbal communication took less than 10 seconds, but the impact on Sasuke's panic was obvious. The black-haired genin inhaled and exhaled deeply, letting some of his fear vanish. There was still a significant amount left, though. Naruto could sense this and was about to slap his arrogant teammate before Kakashi intervened with a few choice words. Sasuke. Don't worry. I'll protect you, all of you. I won't let my comrades die. His words traveled through the fog, sounding at once both close and far away. There was a collective sigh of relief that Naruto did not share in. Try as the Junin might, he was only human. Don't be so sure of that, Kakashi, Zabuza chuckled his voice coming from all directions at once. Naruto could hear his heart throbbing like thunder. How long was this man going to toy with them? Zabaza's mutterings soon filled his ears. He remembered the chant of a human body's weak points, but it still chilled him to the bones to hear it. The main reason, other than the fact it was incredibly creepy and instilled fear in the hearts of men, lay in fact he knew what would happen directly after. True to form, Zubaza appeared inside the defense formation, weapon at the ready. Naruto felt the man's breath on his neck. His hair stood even further on end. Slowly, 
the blonde head arched around to fact the half-covered face of his enemy. The next few moments elapsed at a nightmarish crawl. Before Sasuke or Sakura had any time to even flinch, the missing ninja's elbow drove into Naruto's belly with incredible speed and force, he didn't even cry out. The taste of coppery blood covered his tongue, but the Yandaimi's son managed to muster enough strength to shove his bow staff into the ground to break his fall. Zubaza's powerful hand reached for Naruto's headguard, prompting the blonde to swerve to the left, then the right. His movements were labored, but they were just enough to cause the man to fail in taking his prize. You won't touch it, the Uzumaki shouted, blood flying out of his mouth before he fell to his knees. The assassin growled and readied another blow but was rudely interrupted by several shuriken to the face, which then melted into a puddle of water with the rest of the body. Kakashi grimaced, having only hit a doppelganger. A clone. Sakura whimpered, staring in horror at the damage that the copy alone had caused. Then, where? Her spine erupted in tingles so intense it almost hurt. Every muscle in her body tensed when she spotted the sword heading for her teacher's neck. Kakashi sensei. She called out, trying to warn him of the impending death. Nevertheless, the blow still hit. There was a sickening moment when the blade appeared to rend flesh, but it was soon apparent that the teacher was safe and sound when water replaced his form. Zabuza startled. The sight of his own jutsu copied left him odd. The moment didn't last, though, it soon came to Zabuza's attention that the Jonin's true position had played right into his hands when the kids looked into the water with relief. Water. His element. Kakashi had been careless. What's wrong with this water? The Hitaki stammered, suddenly tense, it's heavy. It crossed Naruto's mind to be mildly concerned. With a smirk, Zabuza's body melted into a pool of water and reappeared next to the waterlogged sensei. Water prison jutsu. He hissed behind gauze, executing the hand signs in a flash and encasing the elite Konoha shinobi in an impenetrable sphere of the solution he had been hiding in. This might just be water, he announced with a mirthless chuckle, but it's stronger than steel. It's over, Kakashi. No, it isn't, Naruto shouted immediately, causing both of the elite in the water to look in his direction with incredulity. The boy painfully staggered to his feet and held his staff upwards, prompting a small laugh from Zabuza. Don't, Naruto. You can't beat him, Sakura cried out before even thinking. She ran to steady him, but he pushed her away gently. Sasuke looked on with morbid fascination, unsure of how to react. Run. All of you. This man can't follow you so long as he keeps me immobile, Kakashi ordered, his face taut with lines of worry and anger. The urgency of the command lingered. Sasuke didn't move, obviously in deep thought. Sakura took a few steps back, but couldn't bring herself to obey. Naruto shook his head and made eye contact with his teacher. Even as Zabuza created a clone to go forward to their position, the blue eyes bore into Kakashi's senses. I am Naruto Uzumaki, the one who will be Hokage. I will protect those who are important to me. The twelve-year-old announced loudly, smiling at his imprisoned sensei with those bright eyes. You won't hurt Kakashi sensei. There was so much warmth backing those words that Kakashi could feel his little used tear glands attempt to work. The boy was so genuine, but what good would that do? Don't, the teacher repeated, almost pleading. Zabuza scoffed, his clone readying an attack. Naruto pulled the staff into a defense position and shifted his weight onto his hind leg. Sasuke and Sakura took out their respective knives and stood in front of the horrified Tazuna. He wasn't going to stop them from saving Kakashi. The guilt would drive him mad if anything happened. Kakashi felt as if his heart would stop. His students were going to be brutally murdered in front of him because they wouldn't abandon him to his fate. With unadulterated horror, the Junin watched the game begin. Zabuza took the first move, swinging the giant blade with deadly accuracy and force. Naruto jumped out of the way on the first and second attempt. The third was halted by a distraction on Sasuke's part. A ball of fire aimed at the clone's exposed chest. Sakura threw several knives shortly after the doppelganger dodged one of them just grazing his arm. With the time that had granted, Naruto had duplicated himself with Shadow Clone Jutsu. All seven of them jumped at the enemy with their weapons at the ready. Zabuza's clone swatted the onslaught off effortlessly, leaving the real Zubaza chuckling in the distance before he felt a presence behind him. Naruto Uzumaki slammed the pole into Zabuza's muscular neck, 
a blow too clumsy to actually hurt him. Like a red cape in front of a bull, the orange streak was instantly targeted by Zabaza's outstretched arm. He grabbed the staff before Naruto had regained balance and rammed it backwards with experienced finesse, burying the shaft in Naruto's abdomen. It wasn't until that exact moment that Naruto had remembered what he had done last time to more agreeable results. This time around he had neglected to utilize Sasuke. That was a mistake, no matter how Naruto thought of it. Being impaled hurt, the Jinchuriki had to admit. Not quite as much as the poisoned claw to the back, and less than being stabbed in the neck, he decided. The decorative patterns on the metal did chafe the open wound, after all. If he was lucky, it wouldn't kill him, though. Sasuke and Sakura had their hands full. The clone was relentlessly dodging and getting closer to Tazuna. Every single strike, throw and diversion was being used against them. The elite was toying with them, as well. He was taking it easy on them. Sakura. Look out behind you. Sasuke shouted hoarsely for what must have been the twelfth time in the past three minutes. With the warning, his partner managed to evade by a donkey hair yet again. The Uchiha threw more weapons from his rapidly shrinking arsenal, but couldn't keep it up much longer. Naruto. Kakashi called out desperately from his prison. The bow staff had not left Zabaza's hand, and the addressed boy was rigid behind it. The preteen hadn't even so much as blinked at the mention of his name. Blood seeped from the wood and fell on the surface of the marsh like raindrops. Naruto. The teacher urged again, this time to be rewarded with a weak smile from the Uzumaki. One last clone appeared under the water's surface and pulled down on Zabaza's feet, causing the assassin to lose his concentration and release the cage and staff. Zabaza's eyes widened. Oh, shit. Kakashi Hitaki was not a man to be trifled with. His fuse may have been long, but once lit, it became a dangerous wick indeed. The deadly combination of a cunning mind and the use of a kekai jenke made for a vicious killing machine. Now, the list of things that set him off was almost as long as anyone else's, subject to change and grow with his experiences. Though he had never been in that particular situation before, Kakashi Hitaki became sure of one thing. Watching your student get impaled with his own weapon while attempting to save you wasn't pleasant. The sight felt like having a summon pulled off inside your body. That feeling in itself was not new to the man. It tingled, burned, and generally caused him great discomfort. There was a moment of absurd clarity within those writhing moments, however. All questions about the blonde-haired boy that had plagued his mind until that very moment faded away with one conclusion. Naruto was no fool. Despite what anyone else may have thought of him, the boy was by no means stupid, cruel, or useless. If Naruto, who was gravely injured, could keep fighting for his teacher's life while impaled on a stick, who was Kakashi to think him rash? Naruto knew the stakes. He always did regardless of how he had acted. The act of not thinking before an action in his case was merely one of time saving. For someone who knew their priorities, morals, strengths, and weaknesses as well as the young Uzumaki, discretion would only point to the same course of action that would have been taken in the first place. Kakashi thought of these things from under the water with his injured student floating beside him. As unpleasant as the impact on firm ground was going to be, the teacher knew he had to get his pupil out of the waters before he drowned. The Junin's hands firmly grasped Zabaza's ankles, pulling the assassin under the waters of the marsh. From there, Kakashi sent a chakra-backed blow into the man's face to stun him. With the few seconds that bought, Naruto was tossed out of the water. From the boy's heightened trajectory, he spotted Zabaza's sword-wielding replica attacking his teammates. Sakura was barely keeping up, he could tell with his dimming eyes. Sasuke kept the clone on his toes but was still unable to break the advance on the bridge builder. Tazuna had dropped his belongings, and was preparing to fight himself if he had to. Naruto, being Naruto, felt he had to help them in spite of his injuries. In a burst of strength, the young airborne ninja yanked the weapon out of his torso to hold it in front of him. His eyesight went white with the searing fresh agony the action brought. He could practically feel his insides falling apart. Despite his best efforts, he let out a scream in his pain alerting the water clone to his presence. Zubaz's face shot around to face the noise. In a movement almost too fast to be seen, he jumped out of the attack's range, not even bothering to debilitate the boy that was no longer a threat to him. True to his assumption, Naruto barely was able to stand upon touching the ground. 
Sakura gasped at the grisly sight of all the blood welling from the wound in his middle. Zabazao's clone pulled his sword back to the ready, commencing the onslaught once again. The bridge builder was pressed even further back, and Sakura had to peel her eyes away from her friend to defend him. In the course of five seconds, she blocked three potentially fatal attacks targeting Tazuna. The Uchiha boy could not bring himself to look away from Naruto's struggle to remain standing with his face to the enemy. Something inside him wished the knucklehead would just fall over instead of tormenting himself. Naruto. You can't do anything like that. Get down, Sasuke finally raged, unable to keep his irritation with that unwavering spirit in check. Knowing he had all the time in the world if he was, in fact, dying, Naruto studied Sasuke's face. Asshole though he might have been, the black-haired egotist was worried about him. The Kyubi's mortal vessel attempted to say something in return to the would-be traitor, something rude but funny, of course, but failed utterly through his labored breathing. There would be no comeback this time. Guess you'll have to take over from here, Teme, if I want to live, he reasoned, reasonably sure he heard laughter in the furthest recesses of his mind, causing him to blink. Naruto Uzumaki truly and honestly did not want to die right then. After all he had done, and after all the work, he didn't want to have to face Zabuza once again when he awoke. It was hard to know that when you failed, you weren't remembered by anyone for all the hard work. In a way, though, he was used to it. Uphill battles came with the territory of his life, and metaphoric climbing gear tended to be at the ready. With a grin, Naruto nodded to his rival and collapsed forward, motionless. Sasuke felt his face darken. He hadn't really been expecting Naruto to listen. He hadn't, either. The nod that had just been sent was not one of agreement. It was a passing of the baton, a silent declaration of trust. Sasuke wasn't used to it, and he understood then that he had been avoiding it on purpose. It was one thing to disappoint your own expectations, and another to betray someone else when they thought of you with that much confidence. To put it bluntly, it hurt. It hurt to see someone who actually gave a damn about his existence without worshipping it had been a privilege. A true equal who saw him as an equal was now sprawled out in front of him, possibly lost to the world forever. Sakura's scream forced him to face the enemy once more. To her credit, she was attempting to parry the giant sword with a single kunai knife, and was successfully buying time. There wasn't much, though. If Sasuke didn't act fast, he'd be short two companions instead of one. No matter how annoying Sakura could be, he didn't much care to see her killed in front of him. Then, a miracle happened. Zabaza's concentration was broken so thoroughly that the clone had dissolved, leaving Sakura visibly shaken and the bridge builder swooning with relief. Sasuke didn't let down his guard for a second, however. Immediately his eyes went to work locating the true demon of the mist. He was not surprised in any way to find Kakashi staring their opponent down, but the fact that they were performing the same jutsu in perfect synchronization with each other was a tad disturbing. Every man has justifications for his own actions. Even the most heartless killer is sure of his entitlement to do so. The same could be said of Zabuza three times over. He never felt morally conflicted, twisted, or evil, regardless of what disasters he brought about. Everyone on the face of the earth was means to an end. Kakashi also had his path clear before him, but carried his deeds with far more weight. A sense of duty and justice motivated the gray-haired man. The two were polar opposites, yet exactly the same. For that, each respected the other. They lived the way they thought was right, and in the end it put them at odds. Then again, threatening the Konoha Shinobi's students might have added to the fuel of enmity between the two. Standing on the surface of the marsh water with not bought their chakra, the two deadly men kept eye contact. Every movement was calculated, precise, deadly, and exactly the same. Kakashi's sharing and was exerting itself, to be sure. Hand sign after hand sign was executed, and Zabuza could barely restrain his incredulous fear. Can he see the future? Is he reading my mind? How can he predict my movements like this? Is it the Sharingan, some trick? Kakashi's eyes sparked in recognition of the rogue ninja's thoughts. I have seen your future. The Junin stated, face serious. The last hand sign was completed on both sides of the makeshift arena of water then and there. Your future is death, Zabuza Momochi. An explosive burst of chakra filled the air like wind. Sasuke instinctively took a step back, instincts running wild. Water Dragon Jutsu. 
The elite ninja roared in unison, the formidable beasts of energy and water ripping out of their environment, leaving much damage in their wake. The two dragons immediately spiraled into one another, each trying to assault their true target. At first the battle seemed pointless. A draw. How could the same technique produced by two, presumably, equally powerful ninja triumph on one side and not the other? Water lashed at water, and Sakura was sure she could hear the deadly attackers snarling. The technique generated beasts shoved and clawed viciously. Ultimately, Kakashi's dragon took the victory, forcing Zabuza's into submission and putting all the energy it had been thriving on into a blast that bore a resemblance to a tidal wave. Having just expended as much energy as he had, the rogue Momochi was powerless against it. The torrent slammed into his body, forcing him back and tossing the highly trained criminal like a doll in its grasp. Pressure pushed against very portion of the outlaw's body, and it felt as if it would snap. Somewhere in the back of his head, Zabuza was wondering when things had gone out of control. Losing was not the outcome he had envisioned. Still, a good ninja always had a backup plan. Where is that Haku, anyway? That Haku was in fact less than a kilometer away, breathing heavily and moving as fast as possible without disturbing the local wildlife. No family of birds or rodents had to suffer for the misfortunes of one shirtless male and his masked assistant. Well, not on Haku's end, at least. Truth be told, the water dragons created by Kakashi and Zubaza had made it a dangerous day to be a Ren indigenous to the land of waves. Over 70 eggs were destroyed in the crossfire. The thunderous sound of rushing water hit Haku's ears and he hastened, dreading to think himself too late. Zabuza was his life, his fuel, his one and only goal. It was a subservient existence, but one that had never failed to satisfy the boy. Zabuza's smile, however rare, was the only reward he needed to risk life and limb. Naruto Uzumaki wanted very much to know exactly he had gone from heroically falling to the earth to sitting in front of a set of wretched bars in naught but his birthday suit. The whole affair smelled like yet another strange dream, and sweat coated his feverish face. It was warm and cold at the same time, and without any covering, he felt vulnerable. The glowing eyeballs leering at him from their prison weren't helping a bit, either. Try as he might, Naruto couldn't seem to peel his eyes away from those of the demon. Something deep inside him, repressed and voiceless, warned him not to. It was as if that gaze alone tethered the boy to his own essence. If he were to look away, he would die. This feeling in itself was somewhat exciting to Naruto since it led to the conclusion that he was still alive on the physical plane. His deeds were still remembered, his friends still fighting. On the other hand, Naruto Uzumaki was truly and deeply disturbed by the closeness of his demonic tenant. The terror flowed and ebbed like tides through what seemed like hours. The blonde didn't dare speak, but doubted he could even if he wanted to. The feverish sensation left him feeling drained and tormented. The seal on his belly regulated it all, causing him to feel numb around the solar plexus. In the silent room of his psyche, the Kyubi sustained the young soul as it always did, though the boy did not remember. The human mind was a strange mechanism, but was delightfully adaptable. In the realm of the living, Kakashi took a deep breath, exhausted. His opponent was down. Sensing that, the Junin looked to his students. Sasuke and Sakura were fine. Bruised and slightly battered, perhaps, but still very much alive. Naruto, however, Kakashi dreaded looking at the boy. There was something innate about human nature that screamed out in sorrow at the loss of a child. It was unnatural and unsettling unless one was accustomed to it entirely. Kakashi Hitaki was not accustomed to it, neither was he comforted by the fact that the kid had sustained the potentially fatal wounds while defending him. If there was one thing he wanted to avoid, it was seeing the worst. Thankfully, the adult had an excuse to delegate the task to someone else. Zubaza would have no problem surviving that wave, even if he was injured. Tazuna had to be protected. With that in mind, Kakashi started toward the subdued criminal. Sakura, Naruto. The teacher motioned on his way, not even having to finish the request before the Kunoichi sprinted in the direction her fallen teammate. Sasuke looked after her from his position in front of a downcast Tazuna, breath halted with dread. The wound Naruto had sustained was probably mortal. It had been deep. The Uchiha had seen it briefly, but had still hoped for the best. Team Seven's world stopped for the young female's conclusion. It didn't come for a minute or so, Sakura had a hard time gathering the courage to touch Naruto's still form, 
let alone check it for vital signs. It seemed so wrong to her that Naruto, the most obnoxious person she knew, was so pallid and unmoving. Sakura was frightened by the very concept. Shaking, she pushed two fingers into his pale neck, feeling for pressure. His skin was cold and clammy. She hated the feeling. Her face stiffened, and Sasuke along with it. After a little while, she opened her mouth to speak, letting several choked gasps escape her. Kakashi stopped in his tracks upon hearing that sound. His throat clenched, ready for the verdict he was sure of. Yet again, he had lost someone important. Once more, the great Kakashi had failed where it truly mattered. No amount of victory could compensate for that kind of loss. Naruto was. Sasuke didn't want to hear what the sobbing girl was about to say. He wasn't ready to hear that Naruto was. Alive. Sakura smiled through her tears. He's still alive. Love, by textbook definition, is described as a deep, tender, ineffable feeling of affection and solicitude toward a person, such as that arising from kinship, recognition of attractive qualities, or a sense of underlying oneness. The term alone was one that Sakura had heard used many times. She, herself, had used it in the past without any forethought to the profoundness of the word in itself. Love was not what she had thought it to be. In moments of desperation, it changed. Sakura Haruno's heart felt like it would burst into oblivion. Her emotions, until that point, had been nothing more than imitations caused by impatience or disappointment. In the long run, most of the things she had stressed over didn't matter. Life was precious. Everyone had their worth. The Kunoichi had always believed that, but never fully realized that she did. There was infatuation, of course, but that was different. Love was wanting someone or something else to be honestly and truly happy. It was only in that particular trying moment that her world expanded, colors becoming more intense to a perception no longer condemned to wander in immaturity. The Kunoichi wasn't strong. She knew that. Oh, gods, how she knew that. In the end, she always depended on others. In the end, she couldn't bear the thought of loss ng them. Not out of self-preservation, but it would be a lie to say she didn't feel that she owed them something. She loved Sasuke. She loved Naruto. She honestly and truly loved quite a few people, and until that point she had ignored it. Love was not a simple adoration. It wasn't even romantic in nature. No, that was a different aspect of love. One could feel a deep attachment for someone without that lust. Love was a state of being, an ideal, and a force of nature flowing through every creature. It coursed from her hands into Naruto the moment she touched him. On a microscopic level, the effects were immediate, though no one could prove it. Just a little more activity, a little more motivation. The Uzumaki's body stirred slightly, though not enough to gain awareness. It was enough for her, though. Sakura held her teammate close, fighting back the feeling that this wasn't the first time they had been in that position, his head in her arms. Less than 10 meters away, the ambiance was very different. Kakashi had given a short sigh of relief, but was by no means unburdened. Zabuza was right in front of him now, and the copy ninja grasped a kanai tightly, knowing that the job had to be finished. The Junin had no choice, but even if he had, the man laying out before him had struck a child down without remorse. A genin, perhaps, but a child nonetheless. One he could have subdued without causing any lasting damage, in fact. Killing was a messy business. Kakashi Hitaki hated it, unlike some of the reports about him would suggest. It was never satisfying, and it never filled in the holes of the past. It was just a necessity. A dirty, guilt-ridden, unavoidable necessity. The least he could do and still feel humane was make it quick. With that in mind, the Konoha elite aimed for the criminal's jugular artery. He would avoid any nerve endings, if at all possible. He lifted his knife and was immediately startled by several acupuncture needles flying past his face to hit the target he had been eyeing. Zabaza's throat made a strangled gasp, and the rogue shinobi fell to the ground like a broken doll, eyes still open. Wah! The teacher stammered, turning around to find a masked face studying him from a leaf-covered branch. The newcomer still held several more senbon in his right hand, prepared for use should anything have gone wrong. Instinctively, the Hitaki checked his enemy's vital signs to find nothing, dead as a doornail. Hunter Nin, Sasuke commented from his new position behind their instructor, viewing the lithe frame presented before them. The boy addressed gave a quick and courteous nod. His thick clothes ruffled in the breeze, hiding nearly all skin in a layer of bluish green. 
His headband was hard to discern in the fog, but Kakashi could read the insignia without difficulty. It made sense that the Momochi would be tailed by an Anbu of his own village. Having been the same kind of predator in the past, Kakashi understood the boy's timing as well. Thank you for immobilizing him for me. The hunter's voice called out, soft and gentle. It flitted on the breeze, then left like imagination. The wanted criminal, rogue ninja Zabuza Momochi. Kakashi gave a curt nod in reply, then looked at the body. Behind the mask, Haku tensed. Thankfully, the exhausted teacher had been too preoccupied with many things to have noticed the change. Before the gray-haired veteran was given the chance to get any closer to the corpse, Haku leapt down from the branches to toss Zabuza over his shoulder in a protective gesture. Kakashi was led to believe this was for secrecy reasons between the two villages, as the next part of Zabuza's eradication was for the ANBU's eyes only. I will go dispose of the body. Good day to you, Leaf Ninja. Haku whispered, looking at the scattered group and phasing off into obscurity. Kakashi was left standing there alongside Sasuke at a complete loss for words. That boy was a skilled ninja, he could tell. Probably even stronger than he was. Before he had time to ponder that, however, his knees gave beneath him. The Sharingan had its downfalls. Chakra exhaustion, he mused mirthlessly, it couldn't have come at a more inconvenient time. There was still the mission, and Naruto had to be taken care of immediately. There was no question about it, he needed to stay conscious, and... Sasuke caught his sensei before he hit the ground, feeling every muscle in the adult's body tensing and straining. There wasn't any need for an explanation. If anyone understood the Sharingan's pitfalls, it was the one of the last Uchiha. Sasuke, I leave you in charge for now. Kakashi muttered, looking to the area where Sakura and Naruto were located before passing out entirely. Sasuke stared at him for a moment, then turned to each of his teammates in turn before meeting the gaze of Tazuna. The old man stared at him expectantly, and the Uchiha felt his face sour. Great. Naruto's barely alive, the old man's still the worst client ever, and now I'm in charge? This is going to be a long day. Haku didn't dare stop running with Zabuza's deadweight on his back until there was several kilometers and a river between the two and the group of foreign shinobi. They had nearly succeeded in killing Zabuza, and the young outcast would be damned if they did it again. He had been lucky to arrive when he had. If his entrance had been even ten seconds later, Haku shuddered. Hands shaking, the boy laid his only companion down on the damp grass below them, assessing the damage caused by both himself and the enemy. There wasn't as much as he had feared, but his shame built all the same. Every bruise on his master spoke to him of personal failure. With much affection, Haku stroked Zabaza's face. He would attend to his master's wounds soon enough, but for that moment, he could do nothing but thank the heavens he had been able to be there for his hero in time. Kakashi had slept through the whole of the night, not remembering much of it. He had opened his eyes in the early morning hours to be greeted by the sight of a drooling and shirtless Sasuke Uchiha propped against the wall, a drunk Tazuna passed out on the table, and a disheveled Sakura who appeared to have fallen asleep on the stairs only to be covered with the shirt Sasuke had lacked. If not for the given circumstances, the Jonin would have assumed she had taken it herself. It came to Kakashi's mind to worry about Naruto, but he didn't have the energy to stand unsupported, let alone walk up a flight of stairs. With a sloth's stamina, the Hitaki's left arm touched the inert Uchiha boy, jerking him into awareness almost instantly. Sensei? He asked, hawk-like eyes focusing. Check on Naruto. Kakashi ordered, voice quiet and drowsy. Sasuke's eyebrow quirked upwards, but he obeyed his teacher's command without question. The sky outside was still dark in the early morning hour in which Sasuke was climbing the stairs. He was careful not to step on Sakura and crept into Inari's room with practiced expertise. Even with the space's complete absence of light, Sasuke was able to find his rival instantly. Without disturbing Inari, the shirtless Uchiha swooped down beside the quiet Naruto. Dobi, he whispered, somehow thinking there would be a reply. There wasn't one, of course, but Sasuke could hear Naruto breathing. It sounded labored. Not as bad as it had the night before, though. Just to be sure of his assessment, Sasuke stood there for another two minutes before darting back into the lower floor. Kakashi had fallen back asleep in his absence, so Sasuke shook until one of his instructor's eyes opened disdainfully. Naruto's fine. The sullen boy whispered, 
causing Kakashi to nod and attempt to sit up. He failed utterly, and Sasuke didn't bother catching him. There was a thunk sound, and it was just enough to wake Sakura. She made a few strange sounds when she noticed the shirt covering her, which in turn roused Tazuna and his hangover. Predictably, the next few minutes were not pleasant for anyone, and ended up waking Inari and his mother as well. There was a boisterous breakfast that morning, consisting of meager portions and Tazuna ranting about one thing or another. The copy ninja wearily shoveled in as much food as he could take before eyeing the loud-mouthed patriarch at the table and informing him that Zabuza was still alive. He had made sure to use a casual tone, but the old man and Sakura were panicking regardless. To stop Tazuna's sputtering, he backed up his deduction with the evidence at hand. With that little thing out of the way, Kakashi announced that even though he couldn't be doing it, per se, his students would be training. Before even allowing his pupils to argue, he grabbed a crutch that Tazuna's daughter had handed to him and ushered them outside into the chilly morning air. The day had begun. Any sense of time was removed from Naruto's unconscious mind. The realm of the dead held him close, unable to claim him. In short spurts, he swore he could hear the voices whisper to him again, and others, he heard muffled voices that sounded even more familiar. Hands grasped him, moved him, and he could do nothing to fight or assist them. He was helpless, but warm. In fact, he could have sworn he was just asleep. There was no nightmare. No orange-furred demon staring him down, just the sensation of being completely at peace with the world. It was like being a child, nestled deep in the blankets of a parent's bed a comfort the Uzumaki had never known. Therefore, it was understandable that the orphan would be more than a little irritated at the manner in which he was jarred back into awareness. Two fingers pried open his right eyelid, revealing a hazy and melancholy-looking face that Naruto immediately recognized. It took a certain amount of self-control not to shout the boy's name in irritation. They hadn't gotten along right away the first time they met, and apparently this bout would be no different. Inari's expression reminded him of Sasuke. The sulking look didn't suit the child's frame, to be sure. It made him look sour and sick. Like Sasuke, the builder's grandson had black hair. Unlike Sasuke, however, his face was extremely round and potentially rosy. The sulking didn't suit the kid, but the crease developing on his forehead told a tale of constant sorrow. The room the two inhabited at the moment was as familiar as Inari himself, window facing outside in front of a desk. The bedroll Naruto was using was on the floor just in front of it, rough wood snagging the cloth. You're awake, Inari remarked dryly, withdrawing his offending hand without an explanation or apology. The kid bent over Naruto's harried head and scowled, getting uncomfortably close to communicate the point that he was angry about something. You were really messed up yesterday. Serves you right for trying to fight Gato. Maybe you can tell the others that, too. Naruto was in no mood to hear anything of the sort from anyone, and let Inari in on that anecdote by a light blow to the face. Well, it was light in Naruto's opinion. Inari started sniffling from the floor where he had been forced, eyeing his attacker like a dangerous criminal. It was a manipulative gesture. Needless to say, however, Naruto was not moved. Stop your sniveling, you little creep. The Uzumaki growled, clutching his belly and working to stand. We're here to help your grandfather, you could be a bit more grateful. You're going to die. Inari stated like a fact, still letting the occasional whimper escape his frame. He spoke the phrase with such conviction it made Naruto sick. Heroes don't die. Naruto retorted with forced calm, putting the bedclothes in order. There aren't heroes in this world. The black-haired child wailed, very loudly in the hopes that the orange-loving ninja would glance at him. Blue eyes fell upon him, looking alternately pissed and compassionate. The two emotions warred with one another for a second before deciding on pissed. The blonde rounded on his pessimistic companion with a snarl. You'd better believe there are heroes. I'm gonna be one of the best, Naruto's voice echoed all the way downstairs, causing Inari's mother to startle over the stove. The gruel she was preparing for lunch was no worse off, but her terrified, her first thoughts involving fear of a break-in. How else could the arrival of a new voice be explained? Inari didn't make friends easily, he never had, and the auburn-haired woman was not going to believe he had just turned over a new leaf. Inari wasn't the only one in danger, either. The shortest, Youngest ninja in the group had been on the verge of death when they had arrived, the little girl known as Sakura supporting him and huffing like she'd run a marathon, 
accompanied by Dezuna and Sasuke carrying a drunkenly exhausted Kakashi. They had looked at his wounds and set him up in Inari's room over the span of a very hectic night, forcing her son to watch their would-be protector at all times. Together, the two would be helpless, and maternal instincts pushed her into action. Pot in hand, Inari's mother ran up the stairs and opened Theodorado's find a sight that ultimately spelt the death of lunch. The gruel fell onto the rough wood flooring, accompanied by her jaw. There was no thug or broken window, only the wounded boy who had been almost dead twelve hours prior standing over her son, looking quite determined, albeit a bit pale. I can't stand cowards like you. If nobody stands up, there are no heroes, sure. You have to work for change, don't you? Inari. The builder's daughter shouted, finally finding her voice. What's going on in here? Inari ignored her inquiry and grimaced at his new verbal opponent. What good is a dead hero? Worthless. Naruto yelled. Inari blinked, confused. Had he just won? Had this visiting shinobi just seen the light of logic? Worthless, so you have to try harder. A real hero doesn't let something stop him, no matter what. Naruto amended, making it very apparent that he still thought Inari's way of thinking was a load of bunk. The bridge builder's grandson was at a loss for words, his face livid. Without another word, he bolted out of the room, trailing gruel behind him. The next few seconds consisted of an extremely uncomfortable silence, Tazuna's daughter eyeing the Yandaimi's son in confusion and bewilderment before he broke the silence. Here, let me help you clean this up, lady, he muttered, scooping up some of the gruel with his hands and placing it into the container from which it came. Naruto figured that it was the least he could do for her hospitality. He really couldn't bring himself to apologize. In all honesty, the apology of, I'm sorry, but I punched your son because he was a whiny git who needs to get over his stinking self-pity or I will hurt him even more, really wouldn't have smoothed things over, anyway. It was all he could do to work hard. The act in itself was simple, but it spoke volumes about the shinobi's character. Naruto winced when he moved his abdomen too quickly, but cleaned the entire mess without complaining one bit. The auburn woman watched the boy labor on the menial task without her having asked with incredulity. Like any common adult would be, she was pleased. Naruto hadn't the intention of buttering her up, but she found herself more likely to assist him anyway. He came across as mature, and doubtful though she might be. She couldn't withhold the location of Kakashi's makeshift training grounds from him when he asked a few minutes later. The teacher would be displeased, she imagined, that his wounded student was given lease to run around so freely while he should have rested. She watched him hobble out of her house with morbid fascination. He was in a lot of pain, she could tell. He had asked her how he looked before leaving, but she really didn't have the heart to be honest with him. His teammates would undoubtedly send him back, possibly crushed but he deserved to see them, even if he looked pathetic. Sakura, she congratulated herself on remembering the girl's name, would be very relieved. She seemed the most worried of the three. That wasn't a fair judgment of Kakashi since he was unconscious at the time, but as far as the other boy was concerned, he probably was putting on a tough face he forced even himself to believe. It was unsettling, but so was having deadly warriors in your house to begin with. Naruto stumbled through the lush forest either direction Inari's mother had indicated. His strides were getting a bit more steady, but two miles without his usual energy level, it wasn't fun, to say the least. As much as he should have been planning for the events ahead, the short boy could not tear his focus away from the task at hand. Every reed, rock, and twig that stood in his way was a potential threat. The journey took him 45 minutes instead of his usual 10, and when he approached a semi-familiar clearing, he heard the sound of a butt hitting the ground. You're putting too much chakra into it, Sasuke. He heard Kakashi remark dryly, followed by the turning from a page of the smut book he loved so much. Naruto found himself smiling through the heaving he had entertained. His teacher would not be paying strict attention to his surroundings, leaving him at the wannabe Hokage's mercy. The cogs in the back of Naruto's head had a war on the perfect prank that presented itself. Half of his brain's electric currents wanted to be rational and just announce his presence like a normal person. The other half accused the first of being traitors to the brain of Naruto Uzumaki and ostracized them like the rejects they were. A manic gleam developed in those bright blue eyes, accompanied by a quiet smile. With a sudden burst of energy, he shot up a nearby tree like an orange streak. His teammates remained unaware, too preoccupied with their training and erotic novels, to scan the trees for movement. It would have been a waste of energy, too. 
The forest was filled with squirrels and their ilk, scampering from one place to the next with instinct and finesse. Perhaps that was where Naruto got his idea, for a few seconds later, Kakashi was dragged out of his guilty pleasure by a slight impact to his head. Thinking it's something from nature, the Hitaki's hands ran through his hair to search for the gravity affected object. The Jonin looked at it and groaned. It wasn't even a crap, I was just a small nut. He had let his guard down for a soul nut. He remembered from books he had read as a child that squirrels sometimes pelted intruders on their territory. He didn't care, though. One squirrel wasn't going to keep him from his book a moment longer. Without so much as a word, Kakashi returned to his book. Thirty seconds of peace elapsed before a larger impact greeted Kakashi's cranium. With a one-eyed glare shot up into the forest's canopy, Kakashi pulled another nut from his gray mane. Had the elite not been exhausted, he probably would have sensed his student's presence behind a particularly thick tuft of leaves. Blue eyes watched the teacher in interest when the man dragged himself over to another tree to take out the book again. If Naruto had more chakra, there would have been hundreds of nuts thrown. However, since the boy knew his own weakened state, he had to make do. The Uzumaki grabbed the handful of leaves he had gathered and began to henge them into more nuts. Larger than the two he had thrown, in fact, it nearly made him lose his balance, but the deed was done. The leaves that looked and felt like two pound nuts fell down on Kakashi like a very short rainstorm. Kakashi, who had thought himself in the clear, managed to avoid the seemingly protein rich volley by a few inches. By this time, the copy ninja was aware that it was no mere squirrel they were dealing with. Not knowing what to expect, Kakashi readied himself for a fight. Sasuke. Sakura. He called. Sasuke peeled his eyes off of the tree he was scaling, and Sakura pelled her eyes off of Sasuke. Seeing the look of apprehension of her teacher's face, Sakura began to pale. Who, what is it? She whispered, eyes straining into the canopy. I don't know, but they are very proficient with their giant nuts. The older shinobi stated seriously, unprepared for what happened next. Sasuke, of all people, was never one to laugh. When something happened that was simple-minded or entertaining, he would usually just turn away and be annoyed with it. In this case, however, a very unfamiliar sound came from his airway at the Hitaki's warning. Sasuke snorted with incredulity, gagging down a chuckle. Sakura did a double take. There were no nuts on the ground, wounding her teacher, or in the trees, so what the hell was going on? Was Kakashi's exhaustion catching up with him? Nuts, sensei? Came Sasuke's skeptic inquiry. Yeah, the adult replied, suddenly aware of how stupid he was sounding. Where? I don't see any nuts. Sakura eyed her teacher with observation. Kakashi immediately pointed to the ground next to where he left his book, only to twitch when he saw leaves and realized there was a slight breeze. There was a short silence wherein the team's leader thought about how he was supposed to phrase the potentially dangerous situation without sounding insane or perverted when a series of sounds caught the attention of all three present. First, there was the laughter. The childish, uproarious laughter of a boy who should have been either comatose or dead. Wah? Sakura stammered, hardly believing her ears. No way. Sasuke looked like he had seen a ghost, and without realizing it had mirrored his sensei's expression. Before anyone had a chance to react, there was the sound of a branch breaking followed by an obnoxious yelp of surprise. Naruto was not exactly overjoyed with the sudden break in his plans, nor was he entirely comfortable with the 43-foot drop to the ground that he was approaching at breakneck speed. Gua! He had continued screaming and flailing in fear after his fall had been halted by a grip that was a bit tighter than it should have been around his ankle. Kakashi eyed his catch with every emotion he could think of but his appearance settled on apathy. Well, well, he drawled, it seems you're feeling better, Naruto. Coming to the conclusion he wasn't dead, Naruto opened his eyes to observe the people around him and give his most charming, please don't stab me, face. Sakura's brain almost reeled visibly when the teacher dropped Naruto on the ground face first. Sasuke eyed the orange contours dubiously while they twitched. Naruto? Sakura asked her voice half venomous, half sweet. The blonde twitched and emitted some muffled sounds into the soil. R-S-H-R-D-V-S-H-N-T-H-R-L-R-K-N-Y-E-R-G-R-R-P-H-F-S-H-E-S. Came Naruto's voice, chipper and hoarse. His three comrades stared, Sasuke's eye twitching on occasion. 
The whole situation seemed pretty unreal. I said, Naruto corrected a second later, giggling feebly and rolling over, you should have seen the look on your guys' faces. Naruto, Kakashi said for what must have been the fourth time in the past three minutes, go back to the house and rest. The Jonin's fingers drummed restlessly on his elbows in an irritated rhythm. However lively Naruto appeared to be, the bandages on his midriff spoke for themselves in a fresh red splotch. It was small as of yet, but the last thing the teacher needed was for his charge to reopen the wound. Now, the Hitaki amended, not sounding as intimidating as he had intended. No, the blonde argued, standing his ground with a Sakura induced lump on his head. A breeze graced the clearing, making the impasse more dramatic than it should have been. Naruto Uzumaki bit down on his lower lip. For reasons involving the vitality of meeting with Haku, Naruto couldn't obey his teacher's orders. Not that he'd want to, anyway. The wound that caused him such an amount of trouble was only a third of what as was the evening prior. Besides, he needed to pass out for this plan to work. Naruto took great care to be annoying. If he endeared his teammates in the next few minutes, it would be dangerous to the chain of events that were needed for Naruto's quest for less bloodshed. He would fight with Sasuke, climb the tree with his chakra and prove them all wrong and then allow the lethargy he had so skillfully fought off take him. If his team was irritated enough, they would leave him there for Haku to find. Naruto, go back to bed. Sakura scolded, joined by a nod of agreement for His Royal Highness, Sasuke. No freaking way. Naruto yelled, pointing at his Uchiha rival accusingly, I can do whatever he's doing with my hands tied. Sakura's face began to contort into a snarl. Sasuke looked like he'd just eaten something highly unpleasant, and Kakashi was forced into an exasperated sigh that Naruto was quite accustomed to. Fine, Naruto, but after you see it, it's back to bed with you. He conceded, speaking as if Naruto were less than five years old and asking to observe a lunar eclipse past his bedtime. Deal. Naruto held out his hand to shake on it, and was promptly ignored by the gray-haired shinobi who pointed at a tree. After a split second, his index finger wandered to a more specific focal point. A kanai was lodged in the bark fairly high in the air. With no small amount of satisfaction, Naruto noted that Sasuke's elevation markings were nowhere near the objective yet. Sasuke is climbing this tree by focusing chakra in his feet. If he uses too little, he won't be able to climb it, and if he uses too much, he'll be propelled off the tree, and, the adult trailed off to the sound of Sakura shrieking at Naruto irritably. Naruto, he said you could see it, get down from there, the pink-haired adolescent shouted, just two feet to the right of a very unhappy Sasuke. The look on their faces were almost as entertaining to Naruto as the results of what would later be affectionately referred to as the nutcase incident. From his position on the tree, he regarded his comrade with a triumphant grin. Naruto, when did you get up there? The teacher asked calmly, fairly certain that the boy had cheated in some way. While you were talking, Kakashi sensei, the smiling youth replied, eyeing his pointy objective. Did you know it's rude to leave when someone's speaking to you? The Jonin asked again, masking his surprise at Naruto's abilities with his odd way of speaking. Ignoring his instructor, Naruto plucked the kanai from its lofty perch and beamed at his accomplishment. So, should I leave it here for Sasuke Teme or take it down? He asked mischievously, aware that the horizontal position of his body was putting some strain on his injury. Before anyone had a chance to react, the Uzumaki boy put a hand to his ear. What's that, Teme? Lodge it up higher. Whatever you say, Sasuke Haim. Sasuke had taken more than he could handle of Naruto's antics at that point. Between the fact that the blonde, though injured, could still do a task Uchiha was struggling with like it was nothing was bad enough. With the princess remark added to the current friction between the two, Sasuke did the only thing he could think of. With wild eyes, the young Avenger charged the tree. The Dobi would pay for injuring his pride. To Naruto's unending amusement, Sasuke failed to get even 10 feet the first two times. On the third go, however, Sasuke doubled the summit of his climb before being propelled off in his anger. Kakashi, in a rare display of wisdom, attempted to stop his black-haired student from attempting the stunt again only to be violently batted away. Sasuke charged up the tree's trunk a fourth time, eyes trained on Naruto like a hawk on a mouse. Below him, he could hear Sakura's cheers for his progress. Kakashi, on the other hand, eyed the entire ordeal with distaste. 
his visible eye frowned, and the hand that had tried to put a stop to Sasuke's rage slipped into a pocket in a thoughtful manner. You, Sasuke snarled, finding himself closer to Naruto with every elapsed second. Naruto was running out of tree to climb. He had anticipated Sasuke's outburst, but he hadn't expected the sour-faced Uchiha to actually succeed in pursuing him. Perhaps the three had been training longer than he thought. With Sasuke less than a meter below him, Naruto had to act quickly. In a calculated and very taxing move, the Jinchuriki leapt from his verdant perch to a neighboring tree, where he grappled the branches like his life depended on it. Unfortunately, Sasuke had no trouble following his quarry. A quick glance behind him told Naruto that if he didn't do something fast, his livid rival was going to teach him the meaning of friendly fire. Having next to no stamina left, and needing to preserve his chakra reserves for recovery, Naruto's course of action wasn't hard to decide on. With a parting insult to Sasuke's masculinity, Naruto stopped pushing off his exhaustion. It overtook him like a vertigo, dimming his perception almost instantly. Without any fear of the ground below him, Naruto sauntered off of the tree's branches and nearly dropped a considerable distance. Thankfully, Sasuke's anger had subsided when Naruto was in immediate peril, and instead of causing the loud-mouthed son of the Yandaimi grievous bodily harm, the young Uchiha prevented it by catching Naruto's arm. Within the span of three minutes, Naruto was laid gently across the forest floor, where he occasionally snorted in his deep slumber. Sasuke was in a less comfortable position, Kakashi sternly looking into his face. What was that? The teacher asked his voice unervingly serious. Sasuke looked away from his sensei with his lips in a tight line. What? He asked, uninterested in explaining himself. You tried to assault a teammate for a simple comment, Sasuke. Kakashi reminded, noting that Sakura was looking more uncomfortable by the second. So, I didn't hurt him. Sasuke muttered darkly, earning an even more intense stare from the former Anbu operative. You stopped me from restraining you. You disobeyed me in a way that could have been potentially fatal in the field of duty. That is not the way a true shinobi acts. So, you're comparing me to Naruto now? Are you saying a true shinobi baits everyone else and generally make an ass of themselves? Sasuke's face twisted again, but Kakashi was unshaken. I never compared you to Naruto, Sasuke, the Jonin replied, still standing with as much authority as he could muster. Sasuke's face remained spiteful, but nothing more was said. Um, should we take Naruto back with us? Sakura broke into the tense atmosphere, causing Kakashi to shrug, exposing a Sasuke who was suddenly enamored by the dirt. Nah, I think this is the only way to get him to rest, anyway. You're a bad person, Sensei. Kakashi had a very interesting night without Naruto to contend with. No matter where he went, however, he couldn't escape that boy's influence, it seemed. The bridge builder's grandson had a nice little bruise on the side of his face, Ad Kakashi knew full well where it had come from. Judging from the boy's mannerisms throughout that evening, the Jonin came to understand why Naruto had used the kid's face for target practice. The pessimism streaming off of Inari was almost nauseating. Halfway through the evening meal, Inari tore from the room in a miniature tantrum, yelling at the trio of Konoha ninja to just leave, and that there was no chance, yada yada. Kakashi would have been perfectly content to continue eating as if it had never happened, but unfortunately, there was a female present. He'd never quite understand the feminine need to fix things. Sometimes life was better when left alone. Why is he like that? Sakura had asked Tazuna, referring to his moody grandson. The slightly drunken man had regarded her blearily and began a story of heroism and loss. Inari's adoptive father's death had broken him, and the child had gone as far as to cut the man's face out of the family photograph and hide it in his room. Sasuke listened impassively, but Sakura was disturbed, to say the least, she didn't understand why her teammate would hit someone who had been through so much. How could Naruto be cruel to Inari? She went as far as asking aloud. Naruto knows suffering, Sakura. He was like Inari once, I believe. For him, however, there was no father no mother, no family. Kakashi answered her, evoking thought and an incredulous expression from the girl. But, she interjected, most likely condemning the act of violence that her comrade had committed. It's his way, Sakura, you've no right to judge it. If Naruto's actions hadn't been the teacher's partial responsibility, Kakashi doubted that he would have even bothered pulling the kid outside like he did. 
Inari had been unwilling to look at him, and held his arms in a bunch. It would have been cute in a photograph, but circumstances were entirely different in reality. Don't hate Naruto, Inari, the man had stated casually, not bothering to make eye contact with someone who wasn't interested. The address allowed his face to sour even further, if it was possible. He punched me. What's his problem, anyway? The boy muttered contemptuously, not really expecting an answer. Inari. Naruto grew up without the love of a family or friends. He was treated as a monster by our village for something he didn't do. Instead of feeling sorry for himself like you do, though, he just worked harder for respect. He is trying to become the Hokage. Inari interrupted with a hoot of disbelief. Him? Hokage? Yes, Inari. He toils for what he gets. While he's not especially skilled at anything, Naruto strives to become the greatest warrior in our village. Strange as it sounds, I'm beginning to think he'll actually accomplish his dream. He has a strange ability, that boy. Inari was actually looking at Kakashi in the eyes now, a spark of vitality lit in his formerly frigid expression. Now, you can imagine that he had to train himself off of tears. What would he have accomplished if he had locked himself away and cried all the time? Shamed though he might have been by the Hitaki's statement, Inari's clouded mind became somewhat clearer. A revelation came to him. He, did it to teach me? The builder's grandson asked quietly, earning himself a nod and hidden smile from the elite ninja to his right, who then stood up and re-entered the builder's house. Inari was left in solitude to think about his life, and where Naruto went as the orange-clad genin was hard to miss. Sakura felt a pang of guilt from her seat on the windowsill. Eavesdropping was invasive and rude. Why was it, then, that she had played the hypocrite and listened to Kakashi speak with Inari? What she had learned about Naruto was admirable, but all the same, shouldn't she have already noticed these things? No, Sakura. You were too busy being irritated by him, weren't you? Her thoughts were laced with guilt, but at the same time, she realized just how quickly she had judged her potential ally yet again. It was wrong. A testament to her selfishness. Not just me, she reminded herself, nearly all of Konoha. I grew up thinking it was nothing, but now. Sakura did not sleep well that night. Most of the pre-morning hours were spent staring at a ceiling that was in need of repair while she restlessly tried to understand the mystery that Naruto Uzumaki had become. Haku's brown eyes regarded the lush foliage of the wave country with admiration. The world, which he had long since concluded was not for him, was a complicated and beautiful place. Everything and everyone had a part to play inside it, both at once simple and profound. Kneeling down, the young ninja's hands brushed over a moist bit of brush and reclaimed it from the earth. With the grace of a priestess, Haku placed the plant into a basket to join several others of its ilk. The plants in question were medicinal and the child from the mist village was very happy to have found them. They would serve Master Zabuza well. With a surprisingly clean hand, Haku counted the objects in his basket. There was almost enough for the salve he was looking to make, but there were a few ingredients to go. Sighing, the youth looked at the sky for some sort of measure of time. Morning was almost over, and with it would flee some of the telltale blossoms of an herb he yet needed to acquire. Haku refused to be disheartened, and resolved to work faster. That being said, the shinobi in question continued his trek through the forest. He had little luck, but refused to abandon the search until something very orange caught his scouring eye. A person, perhaps. A closer inspection revealed that the object was indeed a human being. Mud speckled the pallid face of a boy who couldn't be more than 12 years of age. The kid was a leaf ninja, but that didn't diminish or enhance his worth. In Haku's eyes, a human was a human. Nothing more, nothing less. Compassion kicked into Haku's system immediately, and Zabuza was momentarily forgotten in favor of the young, blonde stranger. Haku's delicate hands brushed over the boy in a short assessment, causing the orange-clad adolescent to mutter like one asleep. The examination halted when Naruto's midriff was exposed, a bloody bandage covered in dirt. Grimacing at the new discovery, the well-meaning hand tensed. Whoever was responsible for the boy was a bad person. There was a reason bandages were changed regularly. Infections can very quickly become deadly. With that thought in mind, Haku swiftly ripped the tainted gauze off his unofficial patient's torso. Naruto woke up screaming. Even the ever calm Haku resorted to wincing at the sudden arousal, in the old English way, not the perverted way, of the genin. 
The skin under the bandage was bloody and raw, but before Haku could get a close look at it, the orange jacket was closed by the now alert Uzumaki. That hurt! came the blonde's rasping voice, cracked with dehydration from sleeping for 18 hours straight. His eyes took their time in focusing, but he could only feign surprise when the familiar silhouette of Haku blocked his view of the forest canopy. The situation suddenly became awkward. Well, more so than it could have been if Naruto had planned better. You're awake, I see. Haku took the first move, which was to Naruto's relief. The alto voice that was not distinctly male or female was soothing to the ear when compared to his own. What are you doing out here? Training, miss. I am going to become really powerful, you'll see, he replied, once again opting to address Haku as a female. He couldn't help it, really. Nearly everything about the Mist Ninja's aura screamed, Femme, in truth, when Haku had confessed to being male, the Hokage wannabe had felt crushed. It was a silly thing that only lasted five minutes, but all the same, he really wished Haku was a girl for both of their sakes. Why do fight to become stronger? The gentle voice questioned, a repeat of Naruto's memories. Unlike the last time Haku had asked that question, the current Naruto needed no elaboration. I have someone special I want to protect. Naruto answered firmly, earning a smile from his fated opponent. That's very admirable, Haku commented, standing up and looking at the forest floor in disdain. Do you need help, miss? Naruto asked, earnestly wanting to assist Haku once again. Perhaps the other shinobi noticed this, because he nodded and explained the plant he was looking for in exquisite detail. The next hour Naruto spent was employed with searching for the elusive, and by this time, flowerless, herb. When he finally located it, he quickly handed it to Haku's outstretched hand and grinned widely. Anything else you need? He asked, absorbed in the strange euphoria he gained from helping people. Haku, in turn, smiled again and shook his elegant head slowly. I must leave now, Leaf Ninja, you will become strong. Naruto positively beamed when he addressed Haku again. My name isn't, Leaf Ninja, miss. It's Naruto. Naruto is a good name, the Mist Ninja said absently, nodding. What's yours? Naruto then asked, wondering if the other kid would even reply. True to his assumption, Haku did not acknowledge the inquiry, and started walking off to make the salve for Zabuza. There were a few seconds where Naruto didn't know whether or not Haku was going to drop his parting bombshell. By the way, I'm a boy. The words did come before Haku was out of sight, and Naruto was again left alone wondering how a boy so feminine could exist. Naruto waited in the clearing for about 3-5 minutes, contemplating whether or not he should go through with a new improvisational plan that had crept into his head. On the bright side, it could save the lives of Haku and Zabuza. On the downside, he could die at the hands of Gato, or Sakura, if Gato didn't get him. There wasn't much time to ponder and Naruto quickly left his rationality aside and avered the impulse. With a silent bound, the genin began his pursuit of Haku. It would be difficult to follow such an experienced tracker, but the attempt was made. Throughout the duration of the journey, Naruto stayed in the shadows as much as possible. From time to time, his breathe would catch when Haku would turn around, peering around suspiciously. The Uzumaki hoped, with all his heart, that the Mist Ninja did that out of habit, there was no end to the possibilities for his suffering if Zabuza knew Haku had been trailed. Knowing Zabuza, Naruto feared for what would happen to Haku as punishment for allowing himself to be followed in the first place. The walk was a long one, as Haku never changed his speed. At times, Naruto felt he was going in circles, and that his quarry had, in fact, noticed Naruto's presence. After the evening arrival at the marsh, however, the young ninja of Konoha was relieved to find he was probably just paranoid. From behind a distant rock, he watched Haku enter a well-guarded bungalow. He was stopped at the door, but told something to a sentry and was allowed inside. Naruto wished he could have heard what the boy had said. It might have been a password of some kind. Of course, there were other ways of entering a building, but the blonde didn't like lapsing into WWGD. What would Gara do? Night fell around the waiting shinobi and the guards did things that could be expected. They changed shifts, talked to each other, and occasionally threw things at wildlife. Naruto wished he still had his summoning contract with the toads. In a situation like he was in, they would have been invaluable scouts and messengers. Well, that and the humorous picture of how they would react if hit by one of those low lives.
those guards would get what was coming to them. As it was, there was no safe way to send a message to his team to inform them of his whereabouts. A shadow clone would be detected if there were any skilled ninja in the rough group of guards, and Naruto wasn't willing to tap into his chakra reserves. Hell, he was almost scared to go to the bathroom if there was a chance of being found out. No, he had to stay absolutely still and learn more about the schedule of the hideout. Team 7 was becoming impatient. 29 hours had passed since the nutcase incident, and the loudmouthed ninja behind it had yet to return. From a medical perspective, keeping the fox's chakra in mind, Kakashi knew that Naruto was probably healthy again. On a related note, there was no way that the hyperactive 12 year old would have slept soundly for over a day if even one night of near death didn't keep him off his feet. So, the question came to pass, what was that time employed by? For a while, Kakashi Hitaki had convinced himself that Naruto had probably stayed out longer to train. After the second nightfall, though, the teacher found himself on edge with the missing presence at the dinner table. Sasuke and Sakura also stole a glance at it from time to time, he noticed. Something was wrong with the picture, and even Tazuna picked up on it. Inari intermittently looked out the window. Naruto, with all his interesting qualities, liked food. To be without it for an extended period of time would definitely send him running back to the nearest house where food could be found. Since Tazuna's house was the only place where he could be fed if he wanted anything that wasn't raw and filthy, he should have returned for the meal. Where's the loud-mouthed brat? The builder asked bluntly, interrupting any casual conversation with food still in his mouth. In a flash, all eyes were on Kakashi. He knew the question would come up, and he had an answer prepared. Probably off in the forest, training, he said monotonously, scratching his nose. Probably, Sasuke echoed, his ego still sore from the other day. He didn't care much, but the empty place at the table made him a little uncomfortable, like being in combat with only part of his arsenal. His pale face contrasted with Sakura, who seemed to be turning a little red. Oddly enough, it wasn't from the fact she was sitting next to Sasuke. Probably, sensei? She asked conversationally, though her voice held an edge that only her family and teammates would know, maybe we should look for him, then? Maybe, Kakashi nodded, shifting his position to sternly look at Sasuke, our Sasuke can use his amazing talents to retrieve him for us. Why me? Sasuke worked very hard to master his unease, feeling his teacher's gaze on him like a beam. He was still in trouble for the other day, and he was wondering just how Kakashi had intended to punish him. Well, he explained, his eyes never leaving the Uchiha, I'm injured, and though I mean no offense, Sakura isn't skilled enough to wander about after dark alone. That's a red-assed lie, Sakura swore, surprising everyone at the table. Kakashi just looked at her. You think you could take on enemy ninja in complete darkness? The teacher asked casually, shifting in his seat. Sakura's face blushed even deeper. Who said anything about enemy ninja? You said the objective was to find Naruto, who is, probably, training. You're smart, aren't you, Sakura? Isn't the term, probably, indicative of me not being sure? Kakashi semi snapped at her, slowly transitioning into seriousness. I think Naruto is training, but there is a possibility that something else has happened. If that is the case, I don't want to send someone who unprepared for a serious situation. I need someone with a level head on their shoulders. Then why don't you go? She asked, somewhere between fear and disgust with the Jonan's insensitivity. Kakashi stood up and rubbed his temple, another headache coming on. Why did they not figure these things out on their own? Zabuza is after Tazuna, right? Would you and Sasuke be able to handle him alone in the event Naruto really was missing? Is it more dangerous to be at the bullseye of a target or in the straw? The straw, Sakura admitted, her passion draining. Now, are you going to stay here and let Sasuke find Naruto on his own? Kakashi asked with surprising gentility. Sakura sat still for a minute or so, looking at the ground. Kakashi, despite all his insight, had no idea of what the girl was thinking. Sasuke didn't bother waiting for her to answer. After quickly downing his bowl of lightly seasoned rice, the Uchiha made to leave the house. It was only when he was just about to exit that he heard Sakura's voice. No. She said with atypical confidence. Kakashi's visible eye perked up in interest. What? Sakura got to her feet and tied back her hair, unaware that she was being gaped at by her beloved Sasuke. I said, No, Kakashi sensei. If Naruto really is in danger, 
Sasuke couldn't handle an enemy like the Demon Brothers alone. You, on the other hand, are the only one capable of fighting Zabuza. She concluded, expecting to be berated again. Kakashi Hitaki smiled beneath his mask. His only female pupil was stronger than she thought. Truth be told, he had intended to keep Sakura away from Sasuke only because of her obsessive crush. To his pleasant surprise, it seemed that childish problem would no longer be an issue. Then go now, or Sasuke will leave without you. Sakura gave a determined smile, nodded to Sasuke, and in a flash they departed. Once they were gone, the infamous Kakashi sighed with relief. In a simple gesture, he took off his mask and stole Sakura's half-eaten bowl. They finally left, he told the Gawking family he shared the table with, and I'm hungry. Inari's mother fainted. Sasuke sprinted through the humid night with Sakura to his immediate left. The forest floor was solid enough beneath their feet, roots meaning nothing to someone alert. The Uchiha considered himself lucky. The person he was searching for would stick out like a sore thumb, and orange jacket in the darkness. As far as Sasuke was concerned, his blonde comrade was indefinitely in the training field, working hard to show off and belittle Sasuke yet again. Oddly enough, that was the best case scenario in his mind. He didn't want Naruto in danger and he definitely did not want Naruto back at the house if they returned empty-handed. If the last situation ended up being the case, the blue-eyed preteen would learn something very important about being in the wrong place at the wrong time. Something in the black-haired boy thirsted for drama, a drama he could find nowhere else among his many admirers that would spur him on. Among his peers, only Naruto had the nerve to pull that sort of stunt. Grudgingly, he had to admit that the Dobi had succeeded in helping him in that way. If his rival was more intelligent, Sasuke would suspect it was an intentional habit. The sprint to the training ground where Naruto was probably located was a quiet one. It was a refreshing change, to be honest. Their footsteps kept a rhythm only an insane dancer would attempt to match, and their movement caused a breeze to grace the forest. Upon their arrival in the clearing, Sasuke scoured the canopy instantly, his hands shielding his face. The last thing he wanted was a hanged leaf to the eye. Sakura, on the other hand, actually did her job without any fear for her dignity. If Naruto was going to pop out of nowhere and make her scream, then he was going to pop out of nowhere and make her scream even if she tried to avoid it. Naruto was gifted like that. To the pink-haired girl's disdain, there was no Naruto on the ground or in the bushes. To Sasuke's relief, there was no Naruto in the upper branches of the trees waiting to strike him. They exchanged these conclusions after about three minutes of searching the area, and Sasuke was just as ready to go back to the house and tell Kakashi that the idiot had just you panned ditched them when Sakura flung something at his face. Whatever it was, it smelled bad. A mixture of sweat, blood, dirt, and crushed grass. Undeniably irritated, Sasuke peeled said object off his face to identify it, only to find himself queasy. In his hands, he held Naruto Uzumaki's filthy bandage, which looked like it had been torn off. This is, Sasuke trailed off, confused as hell, where did you find this, Sakura? Over there, she replied, pointing to a spot of grass that was still slightly pressed from Naruto having laid there for nearly 24 hours straight. Her face was uneasy, but when Sasuke's face held a hint of fear when he absorbed this information, it took a great deal of self-control not to appear terrified. The amount of knowledge Sasuke and Sakura had on Naruto's personality was extensive, but they knew very little of his physical condition. Had they been informed that Naruto was, in fact, a container for a tailed beast, there would have been a lot of angst. Still, they would have at least been able to draw a conclusion that wasn't as flawed. Who would take him? Sakura asked quietly, suddenly suspicious of everything that moved. Gato must have patrols. If a man wants to take out a man so badly, it only makes sense that they would are the land surrounding his house. Kakashi was an idiot to leave him there. Sasuke felt tainted with the change of internal chemicals that occurred with the thought of having losing Naruto on his conscience, and Kakashi's reports. Where would they take him? Do you think he's alright? Sakura pressed, causing irritation to return to her companion's features. He's more valuable as a hostage than a corpse, Sakura. He'd be a nice bargaining chip against us, now, wouldn't he? Came the voice of reason from Sasuke's lips. We need to report this to Kakashi-sensei. Sasuke. Now. Sakura commanded, becoming determined once again. Sasuke thought little of her mood swing and shook his head. 
We're coming back with the moron or not at all, he concluded, making eye contact with his teammate. What? Why? We aren't tracker ninja. Kakashi's a janin. He can handle it. Weren't you listening? Sasuke snapped. He can't leave Tazuna unguarded. He can't search for the loudmouth right now, but we can. Sakura recoiled from Sasuke's hostility. He was right, of course, but he didn't have to be so aggressive in how he went about telling her. She was almost frightened of her adored one's outburst. Did he think she was that useless? How are we going to find his trail? This forest is giant, and he could be anywhere within 12 hours of here. Sasuke grew thoughtful, his frown retracting marginally. Were there any other objects left behind? Sakura shook her head, and Sasuke stepped past her to the area where Naruto had been less than a day prior. He skimmed his fingers off the grass and traced a line with amazing fineness to areas where the grass was slightly more indented than others. Following this pattern, the Uchiha's fingers found the sod underneath and felt for footprints. The ground was covered in loose dirt, he noticed when his fingers left the defined imprint. Sakura watched in awe as her crush strode over to a clump of soil that hardly seemed out of place and looked at it closely. Thick soled sandals. It's not Naruto's, probably made in the past 12 hours. Sasuke scratched the back of his neck and peered even closer. The toes are facing southeast. So, Naruto was taken southeast. Sasuke, you're amazing. I never said that, Sasuke quipped, causing Sakura's spirit to be doused yet again. With the information he had just gathered, Sasuke Uchiha paced through the clearing again and found a matching footprint that would not have been able to find otherwise on the actual grass. In fact, if it weren't for the mud that had undoubtedly been from Haku's marsh walking shoes, it wouldn't have been deceitable at all. Sakura, it hasn't rained here either, has it? He asked, drawing conclusions with typical Uchiha ingenuity. When Sakura answered that no, it had not rained, Sasuke stood up straight and faced her with his findings. We need to look in some sort of marshland. What? There's so much of that around here, how are we? We'll start with the southeast. Sasuke nodded, causing Sakura to become a little annoyed herself. But you sigh. We'll start there, Sakura. Now let's stop talking and start searching. The two shinobi took off in the darkness careful to stay together in case the phantom they were chasing had stopped to wait for them. There was the possibility of a trap. Kakashi waited at the dinner table long after the meal was over. He replaced his mask after eating a few bites, making it considerably easier for Inari's mother to maneuver about the house without having to worry about being dazzled by his exposed visage. It had taken about seven minutes to rescue Satator after she beheld him. No matter how many times that happened, it embarrassed the elite ninja quite a bit. Minutes passed, and predictably turned into hours. At some point that night, the teacher must have fallen asleep on the table, because that's where he woke up at dawn's early light with a blanket draped over him carefully. He didn't know who to thank for the gesture of hospitality, but he assumed that it was a female's work. No male he knew actually tucked the corners in. Where are those three? He croaked out to Tazuna, who had just made to get a glass of water with breakfast. They didn't come back last night, ya know. I woulda, heard. The older man shrugged, looking almost as tired as Kakashi. The former Anbu didn't bother to ask the cause. You don't think anything bad happened, do you? Tazuna inquired tersely, surprising Kakashi with his concern. There was a companionable silence between the two men before Kakashi breathed deeply and replied, I don't know. Should we look for them? Inari's mother asked, surprising both of the males with her sudden entry. Kakashi shook his head, it could be playing right into Gato's hands. But they're children. The woman shouted at the masked houseguest, who looked at her with soft eyes. I am aware of their ages. They chose this path, madam, and all I can do is wait for them. The life of a ninja is expected to be dangerous. If they're strong enough, they'll survive. Kakashi droned, sounding as disheartened as any responsible adult should be. Tazuna tensed at these words. There was only one more day before construction at the bridge resumed. With a calculated movement, a hand swatted a mosquito in the middle of a swamp. The hand in question was then brushed off on a pair of pants that were at one point fluorescently orange. Now, the said trousers were covered in mud, and not too surprisingly, more dead mosquitoes. It had been a while since Naruto had begun his stakeout. He had been at it all night mentally taking notes on the shift schedule and behaviors of the henchmen standing between him and his objective. 
It was difficult to stay awake, but there was no way in heaven earth that the Uzumaki was going to slip up after waiting so long. Nothing would stop him, he was sure. Unfortunately for Naruto, fate had other plans. Anyone in Gato's employ would admit that the exiled mist ninja he had contracted were a nasty bunch. Zabuza was an arrogant jerk, the demon brothers were quiet and spiteful, and Haku was just plain, creepy, of course. The thugs judging the shinobi were greedy and violent sociopaths for the most part, so it could just be assumed that the feeling was mutual. One such thug was not too thrilled that it was his turn to scout the nearby forest for anyone who would oppose them. Termite, or so he liked to be called, was actually quite resentful that the duty fell to him in the first place. Only one person had ever been caught in the entirety of their patrolling policy. A civilian looking for her pet, nonetheless. So, you could imagine his surprise when he actually found someone in the surrounding lands. Two kids, a guy and a girl. As a general rule, a thug would have just jumped and attacked them on the spot. Misfortune would have it that Termite was a competent individual with amazing eyesight. He understood the importance of a leaf symbol. He also understood the importance of not being trounced by someone bearing such a symbol. Armed with the knowledge that he did not want to be out of a job or beaten to a pulp, Termite did the only thing he could think of. He got the hell out of the way of the two and reported their presence to Gato before they had the chance to even sense his presence. Gato was in no way happy to be woke up in the middle of the night, much less to learn that there were intruders in his forest. The High Roller didn't hesitate to send out a rather large team to apprehend the two trespassers. Therefore, about 23 armed men left the bungalow before the sun rose completely, instructed to bring them back alive but the worse for wear. Naruto was startled by the sudden number of guards sent out on patrol, and for an alarming hour or two, he feared he had been detected and took the necessary precautions against their attack. Time passed, and the onslaught never came, which confused the Uzumaki immensely. If they hadn't been leaving to catch him, then what had they left for? It wasn't the day that Zabuza attacked the bridge yet, was it? And, even if it were, didn't the ninja leave first? He was sure he would have at least gotten a glimpse of Zabuza if the man had already departed. All Naruto could do was wait, and wait he did. It was nearly noon before the group emerged from the foliage. About nine of them were injured to the point of unconsciousness, he noted with a grin, and three of them hadn't come. The smile quickly faded into disgust when he realized that the thugs were dragging two masses through the muck, one of which was writhing and obviously still conscious. Gato was twisted, taking civilians and just beating them like that. What had those two done? Who were they? Curious, Naruto closed in silently until his eyes could focus on the captives. It took only a few nanoseconds to identify them, but to actually process the information took about five seconds, and ended with him seeing in red. Sasuke was unconscious, and Sakura was bound and blindfolded. The two had been taken down by mere bandits, and they would now be at the non-existent mercy of a crime lord. Why? Well, given the circumstances under which Naruto had left the safety of Kakashi's wing, Naruto could only assume that they were searching for him. Searching for the loud-mouthed, ever-troublesome Dobi. All Naruto's rational thought centers shut down with the guilt and rage, and without even realizing it, he had duplicated himself five times over and let out a battle cry that would have made infamously dramatic guy proud. Without any thought of the consequences, Naruto plowed through the ranks of the henchmen, punching and hacking at them with kanai. Their screams of surprise and agony could be heard from the nearby bungalow, alerting even Haku and a newly awakened Zabuza to the third intruder's presence. Sakura had been struggling very hard against her captors, vicious and shamed. If it hadn't been for her long hair, everything would have been fine. How did she not see the folly her locks could bring? Sasuke and she hadn't had any problem trouncing their attackers until one had grabbed those damned pink strands and pulled her into an arm lock with a knife to the neck. With her as a hostage, Sasuke was rendered effectively ineffectual. He didn't dare take the captor out, because the moment he did, another with less patience would take the kunoichi and. Sakura's thoughts were interrupted with the sudden cry from her missing teammate, a cry that sounded like a strange animal. One moment she was being dragged by her enemies and the next they were struggling to get as far away from her as possible. She was at once very bewildered and afraid, and with the ropes at her feet unmanned, she attempted to shake them off. Suddenly, a muddy set of hands grabbed her bound hands through the chaos. She found herself screaming with the henchmen before she realized the ropes had been cut. With those gone, it was only a matter of seconds before the bonds on her feet, too were removed. Finally, 
The grubby hands yanked the cloth from her eyes, exposing her eyes to harsh sunlight. She winced at the sudden illumination before focusing on her mysterious savior. Sakura. He breathed, the battle behind him ending in victory, can you stand? This voice she knew, and before she even said anything, her fist flew at his face. Naruto caught it with wide, concerned eyes. Sakura had never seen him look so scared, she opened her mouth to speak, but he put a finger to her lips and stared at her in a way that gave her chills from the intensity. Get Sasuke and run, he instructed, shooting a glance over his shoulder. She stared at him blankly, so he shook her. Now, he commanded, shoving her backwards and flying at the bungalow from which Haku was exiting in full gear. What about you? She finally gasped out, grabbing the unconscious Uchiha. I'll be fine. Now, go, he growled, prompting Sakura's feet into speeding back in the direction from which she came with Sasuke in tow. Haku made to block her escape, but Naruto bowled the masked boy over. She didn't look back. The end. I hope you enjoyed this episode. Remember to subscribe and like this video. See you in the next video.